I've decided to keep a journal. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Paul Casty for me, a podcast about film, culture, politics, and Paul Schrader, where we watch every film written and or directed by American filmmaker Paul Schrader and explore how they speak to their moment. And this one, the show is hosted by two guys and one of the guys named Jake Sirwin. I'm one of the dick guys. Oh, come on. One of the dick guys. He's one of the dick guys. All right. This is getting cut too early for a flub. Yeah, yeah. I'm one of the guys. I'm one of the guys. My name is Ian Jake. Your name's Ian Jake? Yeah. And you? When did that happen? I thought that uh, it would be- a sign of respect for you. I thought you would take this as a compliment. Any change to my environment. Causes me a lot of distress. You know I this. See. Yeah, that's new true. objects of my enclosure do. have to be yep. introduced very carefully. Yep. Uh, I'm doing. I'm doing all right. I went to the D and V this morning. You sure did. Um, How I had was a little. That's fine. Um, I was texting You're you about it a little bit. You're not allowed to say that. You simply cannot say that. That's one of those things you'll get canceled for saying. You say the DMV was fine. Which way am I? Which that's way, Western man? Always. Do I? Okay. It's one of the things that you're not allowed to say in any direction. You have to say either that it's good or that it's bad. Yep. That's right. I thought it was fine. I have some points that uh, were uh, some some suggestions I could make for uh, maybe like better, a little bit of a smoother operation down there. But but all in all, it took me about an hour, and I haven't been to the DMV in like f- five or six years, and I don't remember why I went the last time. So, so an hour per five years. Yeah. This is one of those things where okay, it's weirdly going to come up on the show. This is actually going to be important. However, for the moment, let's just say that people imagine because their lives are so frustratingly full of having to work 50-hour weeks, pay your rent, do insurance stuff. There's so much nasty nonsense going on. Brush they your forget. teeth. Take yep. your medicine. Yep. They're all, people are always telling me this. Yeah. yeah. Then the DMV, you hate that hour because it is the hour in which you feel the weight of all those things when in fact i think if you just think if i mean an hour come on yeah an hour every five I mean, years it does resemble the airport but with no trip which sucks like if you yeah. go it's like going to the airport but then you don't get to either be in like hawaii or at least in sacramento to see your uncle you know there's no change of scenery you just walk in and walk out and that kind of sucks. but and, th- and there's some good criticisms. I'm sure we're about to hear a couple. I'm interested in how you would improve you know what it. I th- you know what I think would, would improve things enormously? You know what I think would, would get the, the approval rating of the DMV up okay. like three to four X? Is if they make the card there and they hand it to you. I feel like ah. people would come out of there. It's like the lollipop after, after you're shot. Mm, you like, like to have you, something in hand, you're saying? Yeah, if, if you had your yeah. your driver's license freshly pressed, maybe it's a little warm from the machine. <laughs> uh-huh. Or your whatever, your, I mean, I mostly it's driver's license. Or there was in, there was a toddler in front of me getting a real ID. Whoa. I mean, there was a toddler being, being, <laughs> being procured a be. real ID. <laughs> yeah, we sure hope so. Uh, but then I did get to watch the very funny... Uh, there was a, a very funny process by which his dad had to hold him sort of at, at extended <laughs> arm's length up for the camera. Under the frame, having a little yeah. Simba moment. Yeah, that's cool. Shout out to that that uh, the forearm strength on that dad yep. too. Because yep. he's a big he's a big kid, you know? That's he's a, a nice, parental challenge. Forearm solid strength. Solid boy. Mm-hmm. Uh, weird haircut. I don't know. I was wondering if like the kid freaked out at the <laughs> scissors through, and they just, maybe. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was a guy next to me. Who grumbled, big government. (laughs) And like that, you and I talked about this, but like- We did. It's actually the whole reason that it is taking so long is Mm -hmm. small government, not big enough government. Probably people working too many hours or not getting rotated enough or having no other job opportunities and they probably shouldn't have been working there in the first place. Yeah. The rotation I thought was kind of cruel because they're already, they have to do this difficult job under fluorescent lights and then the chairs are slowly (laughs) turning them away from their workstation. Yeah. Yep. It's Uh, great. Great point. Yeah. They put the pineapple, only if you want it. It's like a pastor taco, I guess I was imagining. Okay, I'm. I'm confused. Are you? Ta- are you having? Have you maybe ever had just, tacos al pastor? You know, familiar with this food? I am familiar with seeing it on the menu and getting something else. I've never had it. Mm, um, okay, and it's this is a, too late now. Yep, 
it's too late for you to understand. Uh, it's just classic meat on a stick circling in front oh, of a fire. Oh, oh, from those from the the wonderful uh, Lebanese diaspora. That's exactly right. Down there okay, in now Mexico. he's a fucking expert all of a sudden, and I he didn't knows realize exactly that that was where Al Pastor. Okay, I would have guess on you... next week's show. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> the Reverend. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, is it is it like Beef al- a la shepherd, the, the priest, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, pastor, like shep, like literal shepherd, not yes, yeah, metaphorical shepherd. All right, uh, no, I never had it. And they do okay, so it was the rotation, yeah, it was a two, a few too many steps, but I'm glad we were able to hold hands and find our way. Yeah, 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 this is quite uh, nice. The, there was a tweet, I don't know who did it, but there was a tweet like maybe a month ago where somebody said that at the, the Euro place. Uh, there should be like a special price to let you run your fingers along the meat <laughs> as it turns. <laughs> and I agree. I couldn't agree more. Yep. Uh, I like Oily, when there's the, but pleasant. They yeah. got the little flame kissing it oh, in the back. Yeah. That's I cool. I love that too. Yeah. Kissing in the back. That's the podcast you form me promise. Speaking of which, if you'd like to support the show, uh, subscribe to our Patreon. We're for five Yankee dollars a Yankee month. You'll get a bonus episode every other week. Covering Clint Eastwood movies from before Play Misty for me, all kinds of Clint ephemera, Paul Schrader ephemera. Who knows what we're getting up to over there? Uh, it helps us keep this feed free going. Yep. Ad free. Mm-hmm. Uh, so please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash podcast for me. Thank you so much for considering it. Even that's real nice. Thanks for thinking about yeah. typing in the punto com. <laughs> yep. You know? Um... So yeah, uh, I went to the DMV and it was fine. I don't know. There was there was uh, a guy who had way too many questions and was like very comfortable just walking up to an open window uh, and yep. talking to whoever was right there. This despite- is one of our big theses, right? To say that the, one of the things that you're really mad at is that sometimes you live in a society where somebody's, somebody's going to do something a little bit annoying and that's, that's yeah. just part of it, you know? I'm not saying I, I like it. Here's the thing about the DMV also is that I think the people at the DM, the people who work at the DMV mm-hmm. spend, I mean, if we're talking like an hour every five years or whatever, what is that? Like 20,000 times more time at the DMV. <laughs> right. So like their understanding of how it works is astronaut. Every time you go into the DMV, they should, they should kind of think of visitors to the DMV as, as newborn children. I was going to say it's like the first day of a restaurant that has like a complicated oh, okay. ordering system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just got to hold my hand. Yep. I have an appointment. Where do I go? I brought stuff. I, I, I think I brought the right stuff. Can you tell me? And and I, I noted this as well, is that like every time you get to the next person you have to talk to, I talk to four people. Okay. Talk to the- Naturally. The, the give you a number person. Okay. She was really nice. That she was, feels like it might not be need to be a person. Oh, it was not just to give you a number person. It's also the like, hi, what are you here for? Mm-hmm. So they give you a number specifically based on what you're... Yeah, but you've you ever been to one of those clinics queue. where you walk in and they tell you, are you here for lab tests? Maybe this is a Mexico thing. But are you here for a vision exam? Are you here for such yeah, and such Yeah, it's just the first thing? person to catch, to catch you. And this is also... They, they do several things because they okay. also say... Do you have this, this, and this? And if you don't, then they say that's good. Come You're back, not waiting go in the get line. that stuff. Come that's back. Quite you are nice. waiting in line to see this okay. person. But all right, yeah. Um, and they have it in kind of like AMC A list or Fast Pass rules, where they there's the appointments line and the ah, walk ins line. Freebies, yeah. But but there's just one lady. So all they do is they take like three appointment people, one standby person. Three appointment Ooh. people, one standby person. Okay. The appointment is free, though. So, it does. all it does is reward you for thinking yeah. ahead and, I guess, having internet That's access. not that crazy. Go to library. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I talked to somebody else uh, and she was like, you know, pretty nice. Okay. Talked to the, and then I talked to the photo guy. He is exasperated because he had just been dealing with the, the walk straight up to the window guy who had a bunch of questions. Ah, okay. And then the last person I talked to, uh, it was like I had gotten her out of bed. Uh, I see. Okay. And uh, she managed to even seem upset with me that I was done. Yeah. She was like, that's it. That was your your biggest mistake. Yep. All done. All done. (laughs) Now, here's 
One of my suggestions, kind of silly, kind of serious, that I'm going to have when we talk about... suggestions this week. Yep, that's right. No, when we, we talk about gonna... mental institutions, residential institutions, is that maybe for a lot of the people who work there, it should be like being in the army. Maybe you only work there four years and you get a little bonus, like a pension for life and that's it. Because maybe that is a good... most people's personalities aren't yeah. built to last. Well, here's the th- here's a here's a question. Okay. Or here's a conundrum, really. Okay. Which is that you know there 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 are these studies that'll say it takes anywhere from like six to eighteen months to become proficient at a new job. Yeah. Uh, and I would think that official uh, uh, official documentation is the kind of thing you would want uh skilled people sure in charge of. Yep. And so. I guess I just wonder if there's there isn't some kind of a trade off or some some need to I don't know maybe maybe you maybe you kind of a there's a there's a sort of a sunsetting period where your last year is like twenty hours a week where you're training the next batch of people the new batch. This too. is a classic system. I love it. A classic system. Is this a classic system? Yeah. Oh yeah. Come Are on. Are you trying to get me to talk about my overlap? my emulator? <laughs> I just put together I... a an emulator system for little my Pretty my little cool. video games. You know yep. the first first thing I went to emulate? What was that? The Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> good good pick. The second? How's it going so far? Paul Allen. Ah. Making a lot of wow. good investments. Yeah. Yeah, the Apostle Paul. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh no, we're not talking about that. That's for dorks. That's dorks. Yep. So. I'm ashamed. Mm, okay. All right. Um do you ever go to the DMV in Mexico? You don't have a car down there. Nope, that'd be pretty crazy. They would say, "What are you doing here?" Do you Get have like a kind any kind of residence permit type thing? Uh, I am always trying to get one, and they are always trying to tell me you don't make enough money. And I say, "Okay, I'll try again. I'll see you guys Patreon. later." Patreon dot com slash yep. podcasty for me. Get this man a little yes. card. Turns out you can be a citizen of pretty much wherever you want if you can pay for it. You know, that's, I uh, mean. I've seen literal ads in magazines to this effect. If you go yeah. on like British Airways, you look in the in-flight magazine, sure. yeah. there's just like ads for like, hey, become a citizen of like St. Kitts and Nevis mm-hmm. for Costs a mere $285,000. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yep, 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 yep. You can even do it to, uh, I was going to say real countries as a joke. Uh-oh. But you can do it to like Canada or whatever too. Like yeah. it's not just a kind of... Um, Developing nations, yeah, developing or... nations are like like offshore tax shelter countries. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, no. It's all around us. It's real ones too. <laughs> anyway, how are you? Anything going Good on with you? Uh, you know what? Honestly, I feel like I'm on drugs. I've, I've slept more than t- more than seven hours the last two nights, and I feel incredible. I gotta tell you, I feel like yeah. I'm blissed out after Why several you... weeks of yeah, you were averaging doing some... fewer than six hours a night. This is something really special i mean the man is i feel like he could take it all in stride at this point he's, he looks like he's glowing he looks yeah downright inseminated this man <laughs> my god he's taking his biotin i guess you don't yeah wait do you take that when you what's the there's a prenatal vitamin that people take that also is supposed it's to just make your hair shiny acid? oh i don't know i don't know but then it maybe okay. doesn't work don't know about that either. That, that that seems to be the case for a lot of vitamins. But I think usually what people mean is a lot of people just already have that vitamin. So then they say it's not working because you don't need more uh, if you're already yes. getting enough. Yes, yes, but if yes, you yes, don't yes. have enough, then you do need it. You need the famous tennis ball pee. Yeah, that's right. The, the, the One listeners, tennis if, ball's uh, worth of pee, yeah. If vitamins have ever made your urine a funny color, write in podcasty for me at gmail.com. Photos... <laughs> Optional. Discouraged. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's a type of optional. Yep. Um, would you like to get into the two questions? I would love to get into the two questions. I began okay. last time. Would you like to begin? I would love to Menachem begin. Oh. I actually really, really would not like to do that. Yeah, I sure hope not. This is going to be a whole. We're gonna. We'll take. We'll get into it after the two questions. But mm. uh, um. I when when uh, Ian got on the call, I was playing Adam's song. Yeah, he was. Uh, this is a new thing. I've a new thing I've put together a just for funny just song for, us. for me. Yeah, yep. just not even a fun necessarily funny because like that's no. not a funny song. It's I guess clever that I picked it or whatever. That's the part that I think I enjoy. Um, I was gonna ask you, were you are you now or have you ever been 
a Blink-182 guy. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Did you call them Blink? Because yeah. I always hated when people did that. Uh-oh, but now no. I'm, well, I've grown and changed and it's okay. fine. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. I would also describe it as growing and changing. That was a real older brother band. Oh, you know, yeah, this is of, growing yeah. up. Yep. It's exactly right. Uh, Dave Matthews band song, that song. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was the type of music where you're like nodding your head like, yeah, this is cool. I like this a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, me too. And, and mm-hmm. you as well. That's why we both know we're, we're big boys. Uh, and then... Yeah. And you're looking at the picture of the lady on the cover and you think that's... <laughs> hey pretty cool to see that but i'm exactly. feeling normal about it i can yep go about Something the rest about of my day i like a lot and but i also i could I can, put it in words if i needed to I'm, if, if but i'm fine upon. i'm not freaking out or anything yep. i'm not scared <laughs> nope don't think we're gonna get in trouble for listening to this uh yeah and then later i discovered that i did like it and then they went away and i also <laughs> matured and thought it was kind of a <laughs> silly a farm I mean, kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then I realized that it's okay to make silly team music and that's kind of fun in its own way. So I've come around and I view them. Yeah. I don't think I have the, the same uh, abiding love that I have for for like a, a Pixies or something that I have moved mm-hmm. in through phases, but I continue to think they're great bands. I would say I look at Blink uh, nostalgically. I think it's nice to, fun to play that music. Why? Just because what? of Adam's song? Just because of Adam's song. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like all my questions related to this film are too substantive for the stupid yeah. part of the yep. show. Fair enough. What about um, you? Yeah, I liked Blink-182 when I was a kid uh, and Green Day and some 41 and all that kind of pop punk stuff. Mm. Um, but I did, even then, I had my weird little rules f- and for whatever reason, MXPX or whatever I didn't like. <laughs> all right. Like yeah. no effects was out of yep that's out of the the sure. running mm-hmm. uh but then i was also like a little eight-year-old boy listening to the gorillas album on yeah. my on my little cd of player course. Um, one song in particular you know yeah uh tomorrow comes today <laughs> yeah we we used to host a tomorrow comes today podcast uh, we did. which is why this makes sense yeah, yeah we it was um we would, our guest would emerge from the speed force, just his head, like in the film Justice League. It's been a while, you know. Yep. Um, I did so it for you. yeah, I, and then I cool. was like, then I had my little. Uh, I'm so too cool for this that I have to like look down on it kind of yep. phase, which Same. is yeah. unpalatable, unpleasant to me, mm. uh, regretful, and I think a big part of growth for me has been allowing. Uh, things that are for young people or things that are maybe just like not intended to be high art Mm -hmm. to simply be be fun. Yep. I think that's a wonderful growth. Thank you. I think... I had a. Sometimes when I get really stressed you out, I get, get an ulcer. Yeah. Uh, yeah I get okay. an, sometimes when I get really stressed out, I get an ulcer on my tonsillar pillar, mm, which is okay. like... It just, it's like a, like a sore in the back of your throat. And I went to I the... I went to the the UCLA Health Center once, actually, and a, uh, the the doctor was an old man who said, uh, oh, that's probably the nicest ulcer I've ever seen. <laughs> and I think he meant, like, textbook, like, right. like yeah, picture yeah. perfect ulcer. Exactly. But anyway, a wonderful yeah. growth. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's where, I'm, that's where I'm at with Blink-182. I do think it's uh, a little bit embarrassing that those guys are still doing it. Like That's kind of a different question. When you realize yeah. that those people are... Are and were adults who are much older than teens at most of the times in their well, lives. Well, I think them specifically, like when they were first starting out, they were like shockingly young. I think they were like, yep. I mean, nobody likes you when you're 23. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I think that's quite fair, but it's also strange to keep playing exactly that type of music. But I understand it. Maybe they just want to yeah. make people happy. But Adam's song. Musical clowns. It's got, yeah. it's got piano in it. That's a it pretty does. serious number. That's true. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. One of the things I, I thought I was just getting in trouble for listening to it because of sex stuff, but I came mm. to realize that it was also because of suicide and drug use. Yeah, and these some types kid of on things. the some kid on the playground said that that song. They there was like a a kid who was discovered having hanged himself with a Blink One Eighty Two song on repeat. As well. and it, yeah, his name Powerful. was Adam. No, not the case. Actually, <laughs> not at all. No. Did your brother Adam have any? Do you feel any particular possessiveness or repulsion? Now here's the interesting thing. Only to me, he was the brother who told me about Blink One Eighty Two. I didn't 
what wasn't the sure fuck? If, yeah now this is something huh yeah do Reflect i have any on these listeners they were all adam songs to me yeah there you go. <laughs> fuck god damn dude yeah um yeah. cool that's my question. What do you have for me? Cool. Uh, I'll do a little uh, quick one as well. What is a historical person's name that you've almost entirely read and aren't super confident about how it's pronounced? Ooh. <laughs> uh, that is a great question. Probably like... Uh, um, this guy's too smart. He doesn't well, he can't no, I think, think of one. I, no, I think what's happening is that my brain is like running away from them. <laughs> Okay. All right, I have a two-part answer. All right. First one, Saladin. Can't be how you say it. Uh, Saladin, I think, Probably. Right? Yeah, but that sounded like a... I know. A Mexican a dish or something, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Well, Anything that's not in English, do you kind of say with a Spanish accent? Is that what you're... The problem? Uh, that's certainly something you've accused me of. No, I think yeah. uh, they. I just happen to know they have a shared origin. I think they have a lot of similar sure. vowel sounds. Makes so. sense, makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then second, uh, my, I think, I don't know if I've told this story on the pod, but my girlfriend works, uh, with children, often children of, uh, immigrant families. And she works, she has a, a patient who is, uh, from Mongolia. His parents are from Mongolia. Okay. I and he. Know about this. Yeah. yeah he going. was, and the, the kid was saying some stuff in Mongolian and, uh, my girlfriend asked his mom what. He was talking about, and she was saying that he was kind of reciting the story of Genghis Ha. Yeah, and, and she said, "Amanda said we don't Amanda have said, that guy." What here. is that? And and yeah. the mom said, "Oh yeah, what do you guys call him again? Genghis <laughs> Khan." Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Which is really good. Just like the sort of dis- oh, oh. Uh-huh. yes, you would. Uh, I, I suppose you would say um, Genghis Khan. Um, I mean, we deserve that. Yeah, I don't, yeah, absolutely. I understand the origin of exonyms, and yet I think every person who comes from that country has every right to say, it's yeah. really weird that you guys haven't learned to just call it that by now. And also the little boy was apparently just like reciting, I am the son of Genghis Khan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, extraordinarily That's hard thing so to do. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and it was, I think he was like, He's just like memorized his his lineage, the yeah. Genghis Khan's, like right, uh, which is a lot of guys. First of all, like, <laughs> yeah. Big, so that's my answers. What about you? Uh, my answers will be revealed over the course of this episode. Okay. <laughs> uh, I basically just assumed that you would either know or we would both be wrong, and that's fine. I mean, I've heard some of these guys: Menachem Begin, uh, Meyer Kahane, Gold in My Ear. I would say two out of the three of those. One, not David admit which Ben-Gurian. Ones. That one I know about. Yep. That one's pretty. That one's pretty self-explanatory. I don't know how to say. Is it? Do you think it's Theodore Herzl or Theodore Herzl or Ooh. is it Herzl? Oh, I I always assumed it was Theodore, but it's almost definitely Theodore. Of course. Why is it Herzl it or Herzl? Um, instincts, momentary decision, Herzl. No, okay. no T in there. Well, let's get into our discussion that leads us. So beautifully yeah. into our discussion of Adam Resurrected, the film by Paul Schrader, uh, written, written uh, not by him, written by Noah Stolman, directed by Paul Schrader from the 1969 novel of the same name by the Israeli author Yoram Kaniuk. Uh, See, I that's gotta tell you, I knew this one was coming. I, I was feel just, pretty I good about Yoram. Left, left it out for you. Uh, I, use, I mean, Kaniuk. I think it's Yoram Kaniuk. Cause that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, the the Hebrew title of the book is translates literally to Adam, son of a dog, and it's like several puns because Adam is Hebrew for man, mm-hmm. and son of a dog is sort of like son of a bitch. Yes. So it's like man, son of a dog, and also man, son of a bitch, and also its name is Adam. Right. Now, speaking of names, I have a question for you. It's sort of a more serious two question and also okay. some ground rules maybe for the discussion. Where are you on the tendency... Of many on the left, many supporters of the rights of Palestinians to exist on the whole um, rejection of the terms of the state of Israel. For example, calling the IDF the IOF, the Israeli mm. Offensive Force or Occupation Force. What do you? What? How? And the, the Zionist entity 
instead of referring to the state of Israel. That that one in particular uh, smacks of that one being sounds online. a lot being or, online and yeah. First of all, like if you're trying to talk to somebody who doesn't already agree with you, they're going to be very confused. This and it is also, the problem. You've yeah, already identified the issue for me. Okay. I absolutely understand people's thinking. Um, and it's sort of like we basically all have to agree or start to do it together because right. the problem with saying IOF, uh, which I, again, I back completely the logic behind this. Yeah. This is just about practicality for me. Uh, when right, we, if right, you're right. talking to people, 98% of whom, well, some huge percentage of whom don't even know about this entity in the first place. Secondly, if they yeah. know about it, they know about it as the IDF. So you're just dwindling down your possibility to communicate. And I got to tell you, leftists have not always historically succeeded, particularly young activist leftists, whom I admire very much. And I'm going to talk about uh, in glowing terms later in the podcast, but I, not one of their fortes for me, historically. Freshly I, pregnant terms. Yeah, I think. It, and just creating new terms. That was the glowing. That was a oh, glowing okay. joke. I see. All I'm right. sorry. Great. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would just say that to me, I'm prioritizing communication over everything else. If you are talking to other historically aware people on the internet, I think probably cool to say IOF. If you are making a public facing statement, if you want to explain why you're calling them that, yeah, you that's might fine. say like so-called Israeli Defense there Force. There you go. Wonderful. You're bringing Israeli people in. Israeli Defense you're... Force, which uh, does a, a lot more offensive tactics Correct. than it does defensive. And yeah. from its origins has always been an offensive force, basically. So look, yeah. it's all there. Just all just there. help people along is all I'm Second, second yeah. point of uh, order. I was getting ready to kind of let people know this one was going to be like tough. Yeah, this is going to be a, yep. a, a bummer of an episode. But then I'm thinking, is that sort of an insult to the uh, many oppressed and um, transgressed against peoples that we talk like about on other check episodes? Out if you don't want to. Oh, sure. Oh, that's a good point well, too. And is, yeah. am I not also playing into the kind of uniqueness of the Special Holocaust category. Uh -huh. narrative that mm. has animated no, right. so much of of Israeli violence toward well, and I, people mm -hmm. of Palestine. I'm going to say right away that uh, absolutely a unique historical circumstances like so many other historical circumstances. Not uniquely mm. unique, just unique. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yes. I mean, all historical circumstances are right. unique. And you know who taught us that? Dr. Ian Malcolm, as portrayed by... <laughs> That's Jeff Goldblum. Great point. Yeah. Now this, this so this is going to be a bummer, maybe even more than they usually are, if only because we are planning to be more explicitly bummers on the show. But I have a I have a couple things if if anyone is uh worried, if anyone's getting this is getting to be too much for anybody listening to this talking about this because uh let's face it we're all extremely beaten down and have had our souls uh uh crushed. Just yeah. by watching what's happened to right. the people of Gaza and the West Bank, uh, let alone experiencing any of it being close to any any people who have been murdered by mm -hmm. the IDF. Uh, so if this is getting to be a lot for you, um, first of all, feel free to turn off the show. Yep. I think Second, that's totally fair. Yeah. Couple couple ideas for you. First of all, Ian the Game. That's a <laughs> game I made for Ian's birthday. Uh, yeah. It's a little... Little game where you, you play as Ian eating pig shit and avoiding a goose. Mm -hmm. Check that out on podcastyforme.com. You need a little pick me up. Uh, and uh, also, you know, go outside and um, do the another Ian game. Go outside, put your hand against a tree, see if you can <laughs> communicate with it. Ian revealed yeah. this to me. That's and a I more do, traditional game. Yeah. I do make fun of you for it, but it also does sound really nice to do. I mean, it's something I'm very comfortable with you making fun of me for because, of course, it is ridiculous. And felt quite nice. A simpler time in my life that I don't, uh, you can't take the shine off it for me. It's impossible. I think it's got to be good for you. Yeah. It's got to be good for you to make the attempt. You right. Know, it's like exactly. meditation is not, yeah. you're not, the, the point is trying. All yep. it is, is trying. Yep. Yoda right. had it flat wrong. <laughs> Stupid asshole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little short little fucker. Yeah. I hate that guy. Um, uh, yeah. I think I'll also just say. I think this this is something that we are not going to be hopefully spending most of the episodes listing the atrocities either of the Holocaust or of the uh, subsequent removal of ethnic cleansing and removal of a people from their land uh, to create a 
uh, very, very unconvincingly justified state. I think we're just going to be talking I, about yeah. the way people talk about it. We're going to be, ta- we're going to mm-hmm. be talking about discourse around it. We're going to be talking about films related to it. So I don't think it's going to be a couple, total slog. Come, a couple come, of Raymond come Carvers on. over here. Yeah. Hey, you think there's a guy who like made a statue for the lobby of the Ubisoft headquarters? Mm-hmm. And he himself sort of, was named Raymond, so of course of, he no, was, I was a... I thinking a sort of Rayman Carver. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say Raymond, Raymond Carver Carver. Do you... Do you hear the music? Nope. Oh, I started playing the circus music. <laughs> okay. And then you were talking... You were just like... Entry of the Gladiators. Engaging with me. Probably know. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes translated as Entrance of the Gladiators by Julius... I'm going to guess Fuchik, but his name is spelled fuck with an I between the C and the K. <laughs> yeah. Julius Fuck. Yeah. Um, that was uh, the first the first draft of American Gigolo. Uh, the character's <laughs> name was Julius Fuck. Damn, dude. Good. Adam good Resurrected. Joke. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now, this is a film from 2008, but uh, the ad- this is apparently a, a very highly regarded novel in Israel, yeah. although it's one of those sort of like canonized controversial novels. You know what I mean? Like it, oh, it was I know apparently, what you mean. Uh, it was, you know, like a Tropic of Cancer or whatever. Like it, it was um, considered controversial, considered outside of the scope of what could be discussed uh, upon its publication, but was also very popular by uh, more progressive literary types and has uh, since become like a canonized classic of of israeli literature it's also a very popular stage play been been staged many times i could imagine myself enjoying that more in fact the stage play yep sure i could i could maybe see that um and there were several attempts to get this movie or to get it ad- adapted as a movie apparently by both charles chaplin mm. and orson welles oh welles okay. wanted to play stein himself which would have been quite something yeah um, that sure would have well i mean he would have had the close-up magic part ready to go sure you know yep yep um and the ability to seamlessly occupy any racial identity that he was so yeah. famous for <laughs> exactly um did he play othello i believe he, he did, did right oh okay. yeah yeah because i know he also staged uh he staged a it was it was it an all-black cast of julius caesar he had an an like oh, that's an news to me. Early... Was he among them? Well, uh, I pray not. Uh, <laughs> God, no, I think this was an early Wells thing. It was a stage production in the 40s. Maybe, I hope it was, I hope I'm not like totally making it up. It was It was uh, an all-black cast of some canonical work that was uh, considered to be, of course, white at the time. We'll figure it out. Right. Yeah, I, I had a teacher in high school. I guess I admire her, her her growing up a little bit. Clearly wanted us wanted us to see the Orson Welles Othello, showed us a little bit of it, and then mm. was sort of like, well, now we have to just watch the Lawrence Fishburne one because we're not really supposed to, yeah. you know, we don't really or do the that anymore. Josh Hartnett, oh, could have done that. Ah, of course, as well. you know, yep. I, uh, you know, you know yeah. speaking of speaking of high school stuff that you're not supposed to look at, I had a, a substitute teacher who apparently like accidentally showed us the wrong documentary about the Holocaust that just had like. Uh-oh. Way too much footage of ah, dead bodies okay. and stuff yeah. um, for ninth grade, maybe eighth. And I think the teacher had to send home a letter of apology. That's too bad. That's a little silly. Teachers yeah, make I mistakes. They sure do. And uh, this is a podcast hosted by two of them. So would you like to <laughs> yeah. give a plot summary such as it is for the film Adam Resurrected so we can start talking about this thing? Yeah, yeah. Um Okay, I think I liked what we did recently where I'm going to give a super, super brief one, which will probably not be of great service, but maybe allow people to hang on for the uh, unabridged version, basically. Yep, great. All right, so we got a man, used to be a clown in Germany. Now he's in a mental asylum, a residential institutional facility, a mental hospital, many names for these places. For Holocaust survivors, specifically in the desert of the nation called Israel. And he has flashbacks to his time in a Nazi camp where a Willem Dafoe as a Nazi officer made him act like a dog. 
and he is trying to process the death of his family and maybe his uh, complicit parts or guilt about surviving based on debasing himself. And he meets a young boy. Also, basically, whatever abuse that he's been through makes him think he's a dog. And they help each other to to uh, leave their state of mental illness, I guess. I don't know. Is that a good? Basically. That sounds basic great. coverage? All right. Yeah. I mean, that's... So, we, we've got kind of two two parallel lines of story yeah there's the pre-war into there's the kind of weimar into well i guess it wasn't weimar because it's already the nazis are already in power but the pre-war post, to well i don't even know if they are meant to be in power at the very beginning this is like, like tr- post treaty of versailles suffering yeah. germany into nazi germany. germany yeah exactly um, and into the Holocaust sequences, which are in black and white, and then the 1961 sequences in the psychiatric asylum are shot specifically in a certain kind of like blue teal tinge that I feel like you get so many asylum set, uh, so much asylum set media. Mm. With this color grading. Me I didn't Legion. think it was as over the top as some of the stuff that I've seen. Okay. Some of but it's also like, it's but, like yeah. 60s and uh, uh, right. Asylum. So, it like, to me, it reminds me of Legion, reminds me of like... Um, some pieces of Mad Men, outdoor Mad Men yeah. shoots. Yeah. Girl, in, yep. girl Interrupted, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, throughout, it's Adam Stein is played by Jeff Goldblum. Now, there's some... You know, I I, I uh, came to my attention that some of the folks who listen to the show follow us on on line and interact. Mm-hmm. Some of them are fans of this movie, and I would like to say, I love you, I respect you, thank you for listening to the show. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can uh, come with you to Adam resurrected his good territory. What did you think about the movie? Here's what I'm going to say. I was dreading watching this. Figured it would be challenging in the best case scenario and in the worst case scenario, boring or upsetting or frustrating. I think the best parts of it were decently interesting. The problem for me is that the parts of it that are unsuccessful are unsuccessful in pretty boring ways that we've seen in lots and lots of times in Holocaust film and film generally. So... I think that makes it tough for a film as a target of like a grand reappraisal unless you're somebody who just says like, I can basically just ignore those pieces because they are, to me, they are unsuccessful in a way that most most film goers would agree. Uh, it's something that they wouldn't want to see at the cinema. And I don't even think you have to be a, a, a high art film fan, cineast type person, nor, do you, nor is this just a critique for the, uh, you know, the matting crowd or something. I really feel like the, the problems in the film most people would agree on. Does that mean that we disqualify the film? No. I think it's worth talking about. I was relieved to see that I actually do think it's worth talking about. But I think so. I think so too. I wouldn't go out and tell my my film friends you need to see this is not fifteen seventeen to Paris. This is not even like a Patty Hearst or something. Underseen gem. I'm putting this below touch for me. This touch I think has more interesting stuff going on that makes it worth watching. I was surprised to find how much it has in common with touch. <laughs> I see. Yeah. First of it all, it does have some in common. Of, You're uh, not wrong. Superficially, in terms of like uh, spontaneous, miraculous bleeding. Yep. Yep. That um, was immediately noticeable to me as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to catch up on Schrader's Facebook. Okay. Sure. Um, can, he's in Sarajevo. We can cut, cut this out. What's That's he okay. Doing? He's okay. he's for the film festival. I think he okay. was on a on a um. Jury. panel hmm. and then he also like he posted like a big scan of his not scan a big like copy copy and paste of his page by accident like he like he took a screenshot of his facebook page and posted no, that he photo? copied and pasted like a lot of the a lot of the <laughs> the text and then also included like it's literally like a chain letter about cancer Whoa. But like he doesn't have cancer. I don't know why I bet he, he did knows this. somebody who has cancer. I'm sure That's he knows. Sad. And yeah, and then a lot of people probably saw he did a a pretty cool rap squat in front of the plaque hey. where uh Gavrilo Princip popped off. Oh um, friends. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's kind of Good fun. Good for him, man. Good for him. And then I was mostly scrolling back to find his weird uh, Palestinian dog whistle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one's insane. Maybe give it a go Google. Yeah, I'll find it. Um, but uh, I mean, I th- I saw in the film what what was most frustrating to me is that I see the way that it can could be a pretty sharp critique of the Israeli project, and I don't think that that is there. But well, I not think... even just not even just that. I yeah, I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but I sure. I think that goes hand in hand with a critique, but kind of an open minded critique of mental hospitals, a look at activity in the Holocaust that was degrading in a way that maybe feels disqualifying for survivors, right? And, you know, questions, sort of, I, I think, classic questions about people who get through an event like this, doing things that they wouldn't be proud of, how much should we judge those people? There's a lot of really basic ideas here that I could see, you know, healing through contact with other people. Lots of stuff in theory. I don't think it's just a Schrader problem, though. I think this goes to the. Oh screenplay. yeah, no, I think this is from the. This is from the the source material, and yeah. that's borne out by uh, interviews I've read with Kenyuk, who yeah, you himself with seems me. to be really confused. <laughs> yes, um, and I think suffers from this particular cognitively dissonant madness that afflicts anyone trying to find a way that. The state of Israel uh, is not a catastrophic blight on the yep. human, the collective soul. Hey, that's a band. <laughs> that's true, yeah. I just think, first of all, do you consider, I don't know, Ayelet Zurer is probably how we're going to say it. Would yep. you consider her a historical figure whose name you're afraid to pronounce? <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty Been close. Been around for a while. She was in like... Uh, yeah. Munich, you know, sure, 20, 20 sure. Year I mean, career, we get it. We're all least. historical figures to some degree. That's no. And Hannah Arendt is going to come up saying Ooh. something very similar. Uh, is that how you say it's, that? A rent. I, I have always said it. A rent. Always oh, definitely a Hannah, but um, Hannah a rent. Yeah. Here's the thing: I would not name my kid Hannah a rent because I feel like that is a. There's such a Why weird not? glottal stop you have to make. I don't know if that's a glottal oh, stop. I'm not. I a think it's kind of pleasant. Hana Arendt, you know. Yeah. I don't know, but okay. um, that's that's gonna that's gonna come up. But um, I don't know. Where should we? Let's talk about let's talk about the founding of Israel and the Holocaust and the sort of. Okay. Is should that where we, we want to go first? Where should we go yeah, first? Yeah, yeah. This is great. How about this though? Uh, we can talk about how it comes up in the film and then get mm-hmm. into it. How does that feel to you? That sounds great to me. Now, the the beginning of the film, this is another problem uh, with films like this, especially the Asylum film, the Holocaust film. I am immediately reminded of other better movies that I could be watching instead. For example, Cabaret. I'm immediately uh, thinking, why I, am I not watching Cabaret? Instead he, well, of- here's the, so this is to the film's credit. I thought of Cabaret. I thought of lots of just like expressionist era German filmmaking, because I think it does mm. capture something and not just in the black and white. I'm not that stupid. Uh, right. It's, well, it gets to color. something. <laughs> so, well, there you so go. Oh, I have yeah, proven yeah. that I am, but I'm talking about, yeah, uh, expressionist filmmaking. Uh, I don't know. Something about the way it's cut, something about like the flatness of the stage and the way it's shot. Uh, I don't know. I thought it did a pretty decent job without doing the sort of like full recreation in uh, uh, like high grain film or something right you know like without doing like a, a straight up we're shooting it as if it were metropolis or something right without it does without, a pretty decent job yeah going going robert eggers mode or whatever exactly exactly i mean i the film is caught in visually caught in a weird space between like some of the the asylum stuff because of the starkness and kind of i don't know i'm not i'm not an architect or an architecture mm-hmm scholar so i'm gonna say brutalist knowing that that's probably wrong but i actually would have said the same thing so we can be wrong together how about that a lot of big cement straight faced structures how about that a lot of the the, yeah the kind of flat expanses of it yeah felt like they could be gesturing toward or could could be they could be photographed in a way that is mishima-esque in a way that is patty hurst-esque there's there's opportunities for schrader's more uh abstract graphically minded technique that's i think underexploited and then because much of the film kind of just it reminded me of like the walker in terms of 
let's let's get the camera let's get the camera into a place that's not going to piss anybody off and start Interesting. shooting. You know? I thought it was a little bit less functional than that. A little bit uh, less like shooting for TV. It, it made some choices. It's way toned down compared to old school Schrader, and I do continually miss those strong choices. And I, I, I don't know if we'll see them again until first performed. Um, and even then, I think they're sort of few and far between in those or those that uh, trilogy. So. Yeah. I still thought it was slightly more interesting the walker. The walker felt like no, it's, I mean it's we talked it's, about like state of play and body of lies and stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. what no, it's, it kind of it doesn't yeah. look like television in the way no. that the walker does. Yeah. It it but it looks like it's uh, I think storyboarding was not top of mind for sure for Paul. Yep. yep. Um yeah, so it it opens in uh the in in pre-war Germany where Adam Stein is the funniest man in Germany. He's the he's the king of the clowns. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, I think, one of the more frustrating uh, and and more detrimental to the film's power uh, uh, parts of the story is his slight uh, supernatural ability. Like, why does this guy kind of have magic powers? See, this is the type of choice that didn't bother me as much. In part, I actually think it's, you know, it's getting into like the uh, marks that trauma leaves on the body. You know, this is, of course, a big topic mm. of conversation these days uh, for, you know, like the body keeps a score type. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't want to say self-help. That's a little bit dismissive. Drowning pool. But, huh? Let the bodies keep the score. <laughs> Let the bot, you know. Yeah. Now I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, it's bringing in that. It's bringing in... What does it mean to maybe be out of your mind slightly in the, in the traditional right. sense? Like, what what does that mean as a, as an experience for you? Does it go beyond what feels human? Is it is it just worse, or is it higher and lower than a a conventional mm-hmm. sense of the of of reality sure. of the world around you? I don't know. I, I understood all that. Here is where I think Goldblum is a big problem because he is playing. I mean, Jeff Goldblum already reads as on the border of sanity in his yeah that's why i was a little bit curious what you mean by in his uh, acting style but what i'm saying is that i don't see any change across Mm. the whole film i don't see him it's it's impossible for me to read as a viewer whether he is sane and doing a bit slightly insane and doing a bit completely insane and yeah. uh, acting uh uh according to what he believes is happening um like i i don't know where he is in terms of his emotional state throughout the film because he is so he's doing so many mannerisms he's doing an israeli german accent whenever he, he feels is. like it that's he correct is, he's doing magic tricks all the time um, I mean, I texted you that that his position in the asylum is basically Van Wilder. He's like the Van <laughs> Wilder of 1961 he's Israeli. Beloved. Yeah, he's, they keep thinking he's graduated and he comes he back. All, yep. He has all the keys to everything. Yeah. He is. Uh, he's too sexual, too hot to be contained. Yes, he is constantly making sweet love to Ayelet Zurer as Gina Gray. Mm-hmm. The like, there's head the whole, nurse. I think, she's know, the head that's... nurse. There's the whole classy ass thing, which is I just hate. Yeah, I hate so, it so much. All right, before we get too much further, I want to address right, some right. of your points here. Please. I actually think, in theory, Goldblum's casting makes a lot of sense because if you, I mean, I'm not sure what experience you have dealing with people who are in like acute mental health crises. I have some experience. It is not something that is always immediately obvious to you it's sort of like a weird second guessing game of would they always have done that 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 seems a little bit strange or this oh, sure, sure seems like sure. they're talking about this a lot i don't know I, is right. that did they just not sleep well last night but i don't okay. think that, i i hear you entirely and i have plenty of experience <laughs> yeah. but i think the film doesn't engage with that ambiguity the film is that's, I think the see, film that's is, where I agree with it but yeah, I'm not sure yeah, I would yeah. put that on Goldblum's shoulders entirely because I actually think in I understand why they got him involved because he reads the exact way that you're saying so I, I can actually see right. the argument for bringing somebody in because I think if you pick a traditional actor somebody who's sane form we recognize immediately that that does become less interesting to say like oh now he's having one of his episodes or something and sure, that's sure 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 that seems uh, sort of a pretty st- boring. St- Stephen King, Jack Nicholson uh, right. consideration. Yeah. There's a, a wonderful uh, review of the film 
by Eric Hines uh, from Reverse Shot, I think from around the release of the film, where one mm-hmm. of the things he mentions is how uh, putting Jeff Goldblum in your movie immediately causes a uh, a framing problem because he's <laughs> so much true, taller. Actually, yeah, and I, yeah. which, but I think also, you know, it 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 gets also at the um, it, uh, let me make sure that that is actually who he. Yes, he he says. Uh, Always a fascinating screen presence, Goldblum's tall, limber body presents a challenge to film framing. He slopes two shots, extends negative space, or crowds the box. And I think he also, you know, he he puts the whole tone of the film on a weird angle with his performance choices here as well. Well, that's, that's the bigger stretch. And I'm assuming that this may be inherited as well from the novel. Because I think part of what I, it seemed like people objected to initially, I didn't d- read as much as you did, it sounds like. But the idea of bringing clowning or acting like a dog into discussions of the Holocaust or discussions of the existence of Israel or something, right? Sort of inherently debasing in, a, uh, in the traditional sense. So I think Goldblum being kind of a goofy guy captures that original frustration for some people maybe because it makes you yeah. say okay are you taking this seriously do you know the the gravity of which of the yeah. event of which you speak basically well holocaust clown corner it's time yeah for okay. holocaust clown, holocaust clown corner because there have been now a number of attempts at this sort of there thing. sure have did you have a chance to watch life is beautiful i did not well i i had a chance i okay. did not take it <laughs> You didn't see the I opportunity. Had plenty of chances. Yeah, yeah. Lifetime worth. Almost. I zagged. I was busy playing Brave Fencer Musashi on an Ooh, emulated PlayStation. Cool. Heard of it? Never played. It's actually. Yeah. I mean, this game is about me for real. In that, okay. uh, a big concern in it is uh, making sure that you don't get too tired. Ah, uh, and yep. also eating food before it goes bad. Sure. Yeah. And I swear to you, I'll take a screen grab and send it to you. I am currently when I when I enter the sub menu, it says level one little turd. <laughs> That's real. It's like and a silly. You didn't enter game. that name. Okay. Cool. I don't recall. No. All right. Unless somebody, maybe the guy who like ripped the ROM put that in there to sure to fuck with everybody. He knew you were gonna. Yeah. That's if fun. you ripped that ROM. Podcasting for me at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, no, but but uh, I did not have a chance to watch Life is Beautiful, but that is one of the ones I'm talking about. There's, of course, right. The Day the Clown Cried, the unreleased, unfinished Almost Jerry no one has Lewis seen that film. film. Yeah. I would argue that maybe no one has. I think Harry Shearer is lying uh, about that and all kinds of things. I'm just mm. inclined to <laughs> distrust Harry Shearer. I think he's really that annoying. I understand. Yeah. I think... I think Godard claimed to have seen it or maybe just said no, that he thought it was a good that. idea, but French. You know. Jerry Lewis, this is a film that he made and yes. disowned, said he was like, he was embarrassed when people talked about it, even well, as a th- joke, basically. I think th- I think also the the sort of unreleasability because it's bad has has grown yeah. in in legend because the idea of the film is so stupid. What's What really happened initially is that the guy who put up the money, the producer who put up the money for it, hadn't actually like his his option expired before the film entered production and then he was okay. too broke to pay the like the screenwriter for the rights to make the movie and they never ah. resolved it with her oh i didn't hear this okay but i think then afterward this gave everyone uh an important breathing period uh and then they could return to the film with fresh eyes and say that's a, that is we can be we grateful be for that this. sometimes yeah something i learned uh jerry lewis is not playing jewish in that film he's playing a german clown who is imprisoned uh and and later interned in a concentration camp for making fun Subversive of adolf hitler activity. I in see. A, okay. like in a bar yeah and then similar very similar to this film he ends up like he's clowning to impress the children or to to like Make the children's uh make the children in the in the camp laugh, and then this is uh taken advantage of by the camp administration who ha- they have him sort of clown the children toward the gas chamber um and and he sees himself as kind of uh helping them in their final moments and and others see him as enabling genocide and it's sort of a uh, question in the film until he apparently at the end uh it's hard to say he kills himself because he simply uh 
goes into the gas chamber. I, I mean, see. he okay. would have been killed otherwise, I think. Yeah, he allows himself to be killed. Yeah, that's a tough way to describe something. Yeah. Uh, then there's also Life is Beautiful, which is a similar, like... Yeah, the- I haven't seen it in a decade. My recollection is that, yeah, obviously he is uh, uh, imprisoned also, and he is, like, trying to make the other prisoners laugh, but also sometimes slightly wins over the guards. Some people get mad at him because they see it as, like, not a laughing situation, right? But he's so mostly... He he, the, the point of the film is that he's like hiding what's really happening from his son that's right? correct it's like, yes so he's trying to like all a game yes that's it. he he presents it as a game he's trying to create this illusion to uh, preserve his son's mind from trauma or something protect yeah um update to the the ongoing discussion of life is beautiful which has come up on this show so many times <laughs> for some reason yeah. so i early in the show was stunned to learn that Roberto Benigni is not Jewish because yeah. I assumed who mm-hmm. would do this if they weren't yeah. uh, at least a confused Jewish person. Um, it turns out, while he's not Jewish, it is in part based on a book by an Italian Jew mm, called like okay. I Beat Hitler After All or something. It's like a see. memoir of a guy who basically says like, you know, I survived the Holocaust and then had a uh, fulfilling, wonderful life afterwards okay. so Hitler can... Go screw, which, mm-hmm. sure. Uh, but then Benigni's father also was interned at Bergen-Belsen as a, I think like as an Italian combatant or something. There was a okay. point late yeah. late like in the war where reason. Italy yeah. became co-belligerents with uh-huh. the Allies. Yep. Um, so, he does have some much closer connection to the Holocaust than I previously thought. That being said, still a very bad idea for a movie. There's also Jacob the Liar. Which yeah, is, I've never seen Jacob the Liar, but uh, it is uh, a sort of a pre-Holocaust movie. It's about mm. the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, and and involves Robin Williams or the guy who plays Jacob in the I think Czech film of it from the seventies, mm. um, who is pretending to be receiving radio transmissions with good news, uh, okay, and, yeah, and sounds... passing this on to yeah. his neighbors, basically. Mm-hmm keeping their spirits up and yeah. then it becomes a thing where like the nazis are like you know no one is supposed to have a radio in the ghetto where is uh-huh. the radio we will find the radio and uh this is not real there's no yeah and, yeah and then he's forced to admit that there is no and then i think it ends with everybody getting in a fucking cattle car which like so why would you watch this We've wandered slightly from the state of Israel, but we are now arriving at another question, which is, is it possible to address an event like this filmically? Certainly seems very, very difficult. Is that fair to say? It does. I think one of the things that that struck me watching this movie is how much it relies on your previous understanding of the Holocaust. I mean, there's the famous Michael Haneke thing about how in Schindler's List, another film I haven't seen, uh, Spielberg makes entertainment basically makes a suspense of a gas chamber when you know there's like a close-up on a on a shower head and you don't know if it's gonna be zyklon b or uh or or water water yes i Um, agree with our friend hanneke here this is one of the spielberg films Uh, i know you make fun of me and say imply things like i don't like spielberg but in fact, I agree with you that E.T., Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, some of the great the films, ones, yeah. Jaws. No. Uh, I think he has the emotional maturity of a uh, very smart child. And yeah. I think that works really, really well for films that rely on the emotional maturity of a child. All the ones that I mentioned. I think it does not work for Schindler's List. I'd say that the Fablements does rely a lot on the emotional maturity of a child until the later parts of the film. That's but which I think are the worst talking, parts of the film. Yeah. We're not talking about the film. We're not. Um, no, and I, I was reminded of that and there's there's a part of this film where Schrader basically does the same thing. He does like a tilt up uh, above a building and you see that there's smoke coming out of the chimney and you sort of realize or maybe confirm that this is a, a gas chamber or a crematorium. And there's I think there's an inherent difficulty... Because either these films choose to go the route of, even if it was a historical event, we experienced it as individuals, as people with families. And so we're going to tell the story as a story of individuals, as humans, which is true to a certain extent. Right. But of course, that fails to capture, like you're saying, the sort of uh, massive quality of it, right? The, the sort of yeah. like barely comprehensible quality. Or you try to capture that. 
And that's similarly something the humans can't really wrap their heads around so that it becomes like so overpowering, so all engulfing that it, it's just kind of like an abstract exercise. Right. And then there's the question of like, is it responsible for people further and further from this event to depict it? For example, if you are, if you, you know, don't know anybody who survived the Holocaust and don't know anybody, you, you, first of all, you aren't a Holocaust survivor or a, and that includes like Jews who left Germany in the twenties or whatever, like uh-huh. a Holocaust evader, I guess. Uh, and you aren't like related to anyone like that. You know, if someone making a Holocaust film now, like, is that, is there anything responsible about that unless you're making a documentary? But if the answer to that is no, then does it, do we, do we worry about it slipping from the the collective consciousness? Which I think is a fair concern. I think how many times have you heard, maybe this is people being online, but I think I've heard it even from older family members, that sense of sort of like exhaustion that they feel like it's, it overpowers fiction somehow. And that, yeah. you know, they're, they're tired of saying it, which I can understand being wary of that to say, okay, you're, you're so yeah. ready to <sighs> obliterate this historical events from your head. I was so st- struck watching this movie because it's shot in Germany and Israel. And I was thinking one of these people in the background of this, these scenes, there's at least one of these people who has shaved their head once before to be a Holocaust extra. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like that must oh, be yeah. like a thing. Is there somebody who keeps their head shaved like like a like someone with a with an arm amputation who becomes a stuntman for whenever like the predator gets his arm cut off or whatever? Yeah. I Are mean, there just but like, people it's standing by? much weirder. Yeah. And Yeah. It, but like you're saying the alternative does it only exist in history books? People aren't great right. at understanding things through history books either. So do we eliminate these maybe condescending or reductive right. representations? I don't know. I that's that doesn't seem like a great option. But then I, you know, I I think I sent you a photo of this from the bookstore. It was at the Barnes and Noble fo- you bookstore. You did send me this. Um, yeah. And I saw a cover of a New York Times bestseller, over one million copies sold. Very popular book. The I've Heather Morris since. novel, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, which has yeah. since been made into a mini series starring Harvey Keitel from Blue yep. Collar. That's right. But I sent you the the cover of this because it's it's got like this flowery script. Uh, it, the 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 title is written in this script with this very sort of swoopy ligature between the C and the H in Auschwitz. And something about this particular graphic design choice just really said to me, like, we've lost the thread here. Someone who it. approved this. this it's is... like somebody making a Holocaust Pinterest board parentheses frowny face. And right. You think, exactly. Okay, or like, uh-oh. I mean, have you have you seen the TikTok like Holocaust victim role play stuff? No, I don't know. About I this. mean, we don't I have don't... to get into it, but okay. it's like I, and I think this honestly can be chalked up to young people trying to make sense of the world through the yeah. the means of their time but it right. is like someone making a tiktok where they've literally i think taken like coffee grounds and like rubbed them on their face to make them look Man. dirty and you know same like i'm 14 and i was kidnapped from my uncle's basement in warsaw and now i'm dead or whatever like it's Look, I I actually think this is an illuminating example because something that I struggle with now is I grew up in an area, we've talked about it, rich and also decently liberal in a California way. And all of the ways that you try to teach kids from a background like that about global suffering. Right. You tell all all the kids with blue eyes to go to this side of the room and then like then you get or, fired <laughs> or you take them on an yeah. actual trip and then you're doing kind of disaster tourism or or poverty right, and then, tourism like, and are they finger blasting each other on the charter bus back yeah. from the the plantation house like maybe and are they wrong i don't know you know and then maybe did they understand it less because they think they understand it because they went to go build houses in tijuana or something you know and it's like mm-hmm. i don't uh, I mean, and there's tough. the whole thing about how like uh Auschwitz Birkenau and and these other like um, museums and sites of of the Holocaust have to tell people to stop taking selfies in front of the yep Arbeit macht frei like gate or whatever right I have a question for you do you think this film has a um, more less or equally nuanced depiction of the Holocaust to the opening of 
X-Men or X-Men 2, whichever one has. I, yeah, X-Men. You're talking about the one that opens with Eric. I, I, because I think that honestly, it was more affecting, but I can't tell if that's because I was a child when I saw it. Well, I think in one sense, it does this give more time to an individual separation of a family. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I, I mean, this is not a joke to me. This is a, a very fair question. And again, I, I do wonder if part of it was being 10 years old or however old I was, was when I saw X-Men. But I don't know. I remember it affecting me more than anything in this film affected yep. me. I think this film is aiming for something higher in fairness to it. I think it is. It's trying to or, or something more complex, something muddier. Sure. Although the first scene of X-Men, pretty muddy. But it almost immediately, we almost like as soon as he gets to, it's not Booking Vault. Which one is it? Uh, in the in this film, yeah, he is at. Do they say in the movie? I don't know. Uh, okay. I, I I can't remember. But as soon as he, as soon as Stein and his family get off the the train, mm-hmm. he is almost immediately being instructed to act like a dog by yeah. uh, Commandant Klein, the the Willem Dafoe character. Um, and he just like jumps into it, and his wife and child are pulled away from him. Very quickly and sort of without well, fanfare, I, uh, and it's not. But it's not also. It's it's also. I think not successfully played, like successfully underplayed. To that, to... I agree with. I think it actually is fair to go underplayed because I don't know that it's always. Uh, you know, cue the strings. He tries to go back, and the the Nazi says, "If you look back at them one more time, I'm going to kill them right here." And he begrudgingly gets down on all fours. I don't think it has to be that way because the process is in real life was strange and arbitrary right. and sure, sure, didn't sure. give you time but, to react emotionally but i think maybe maybe then where the question the answer to the question of whether the holocaust should be depicted is it should be documentary there's only there's the only like documenting and and maybe if you feel compelled to make more holocaust documentaries drilling down further into specific instances yeah. yep um, I think I think that some, can still move people, catch yeah. people by surprise. And, and I say, think something like the zone of interest is an important and and unexplored angle through which to make a movie about the Holocaust. I think the fact that it pissed a bunch of people off. Yeah. Uh, and I disagree with all those people. I think that mm-hmm. suggests that it uh, did something significant in a way that the tattooist of Auschwitz, for yes. example, has not. You and I agree about that. And I also think that there's maybe a strong argument because most of the people in the world are closer to the to being in the zone of interest family position. Well, most of the I should take that back. Not most people most in the, the world. Viewers. Most of the people, yes, yeah. thank you. Most of the people who would see that film, uh, particularly as like a high end art film that was only available at your like the Cine Arts or something. Yeah, and the are theater closer that, to being the Tarantino owns. Yeah. Yes, exactly. In that case, I think it's possibly more important for you to see zone of interest than to see this film or to see Schindler's List yeah. or something. But like, where does, I mean, how many times have you seen like a video of someone recently saying like, this was the beach in Tel Aviv today. Is there a beach in Tel Aviv? Yeah, uh, in Tel Aviv? I don't know. In, I don't know. This was, the, you yeah. know, this is the beach in Israel today and it's a bunch yeah. of people dancing and yeah. playing volleyball and someone quote tweets it with zone of interest. <laughs> right. Uh, like exactly. It's, yeah. 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 Um, but to sort of return to the film, I think that one of the. The underexplored potentiality, the underexplored potential mm. um, bit of of substance here is this asylum as metaphor for the Israeli project more broadly, right? I mean, it's it's and it ha- the the way that it goes about presenting that has its own problems because it's a you know it's a it's a newly built sort of technologically advanced edifice in the middle of the desert. With suggests, some people involved having good intentions, at least yes. for some of the other people involved. And it suggests, first of all, that there was nothing there before. There's exactly one Arab, Arabic-speaking character in the film. I thought you were going to address this when you were starting to do a little plot summary yourself, because the film the film actually opens uh, with him at his at the, the pension where he lives at this like, he does, place. He does, actually. Yeah, and I actually think this is a nice bit of misdirection, because... It's unclear like what's happening, and obviously there's some some uh, sort of like Nazi time. reference, and yeah. also because I think it says 1961, but in a way that uh, I think reflects the the experience of mentally ill people in a lot of cases, uh, yep. or extremely mentally ill. But it's like there's just uncertainty about what's happening, why it's happening, 
is this the right thing? Should we feel good about this? Should we feel bad about this? Right. Make sure of sympathy at, and fear. Exactly. From and his, then he, his landlady. Yep. He arrives at the asylum and basically, I don't mean to be too glib, but it's like he daps up the black guy at the gate. He does. No, he daps up the the Palestinian man who like mans he the gate. He says what's up to him in Arabic at the gates as sort of right. like, look, it's I, part of I'm his one Van of these, Wilder I'm intro. one of these guys who like, I like all the people. It doesn't matter where they are. And I, yeah, it's I, fucking, it's fucking Ray Liotta going in the back of the Copa. Like it's yep. that exactly. But it's, like it's specifically indicating his racial inclusivity and, and that he's not, that's right. not one of the elements at play here. We should and all that's relax. The, that's the only Palestinian character in the film. Yep. He, I don't think says anything, maybe at all, but certainly not in English. I think he he's, seems, to, yeah, he seems to be like, Happily employed in a menial task that that serves the greater needs of these Israeli settlers. But I think so. Putting that aside for a second, the fact that the the myth of this is as barren, untapped yeah. land waiting for the arrival of the 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 triumphant return of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's. A place where a bunch of people driven insane by the Holocaust are brought to try to move forward as best they can with the help of lots of money from American and European Jews. Mm -hmm. And it's not really working that well. And uh, the famous Jewish humor is of uncertain yeah, questionable assistance. value. Yes. Is it is it allowing them to, to continue on in this impossible scenario or is it... A mask that hides actual trauma that needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, and the famous Jewish humor, uh, I think black bile, I had to guess. <laughs> no. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on that Probably, one, yeah. probably, wait, what are they? There's yellow bile, black bile, blood, and... Oh, shit. Pus? What is... <laughs> um, I don't know what the last one is. I don't remember. Yeah, there are four, though. Uh, anyway. Uh, okay. Th- but the, you know, it's... I think in my in my experience, both as attempted purveyor of same and as uh, occasional student of same, it seems yeah. largely of the court jester type, where it sort of acts as a pressure valve on the the state of things rather than uh, transformational in its in its. Uh, well, aspect. I think the film struggles with the idea of we also have in the form of uh, Abe Wolfowitz. A character who is basically like dealing more explicitly with the trauma. Mm-hmm. I mean, at Curse times, I was going to say at times in a way that's lightly affecting and lightly effective. He's starting to narrate the, the awful things that happened to his family, having to hide his daughter in a sub basement. But then it very quickly becomes him throwing sand at God and not in an underplayed, like, let it speak for itself way, but in the kind of way that you expect from a movie like this a little bit. Yeah. Where, and I, I mean, I- you know, it gets a, not necessarily the old boy problem, what I've coined the old boy problem. Okay. But like when he's talking about his, this is maybe an issue with the Holocaust fiction. He's talking about his daughter basically being like trapped in a tiny hole beneath a basement with a Purim crown on her head and like yeah. refusing to take off the crown. And so she's like a Japanese square watermelon, like growing, uh, she's she's being tortured by by having a growth spurt inside of a confined space and like refuses to take the crown off so her head gets like a weird indentation in the crown. And like unless this actually documentedly happened to someone, you, Yoram Kenyuk, you're making this up. You have you have afflicted a fictional Jewish child with I see this what you're experience. Saying. Yeah, that's tough though, man. I I think people had the same objections about Django and I I'm a little bit torn because there there were enough historical atrocities where I would say, of course, you could draw from them. But is it better to pick one of the real ones? I don't know. That's I, difficult well, for me. Yeah, I like. I would guess you feel? Would you feel? Neither option is great. Yeah. Would you feel excited to realize that this, like, or whatever they chose to represent, was something that happened to people who were hiding? I don't. I, that wouldn't help me a ton. It would maybe give it some weight, I suppose, if that's what you're looking for. But. Yeah, and I look, I hope we are not sounding like we are minimizing the Holocaust as an event. I think we are questioning all all we're trying to do here is is like 
work just out. Just asking questions. With no, the all we're trying to do here is work out how do you even successfully address something like this that was so horrific, but also maybe left a people or a subset of a people traumatized enough that they went on to make some uh, uh, genocidal or borderline genocidal decisions of their own. Well, that is a terrific, terrific segue. Okay. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, because I think one of the big things about Holocaust fiction, especially post like Holocaust survivor fiction, uh, which this film is, is a potent example is like, how do you, the question of how do you continue to live yep. in the face of this? That's right. And like, what responsibilities do you have, et cetera? We talked mm. about this a little bit on the, when, when I, I forgot when Chronicle of a Summer came up, but I mentioned that, that documentary where there's a woman in that film who is a Holocaust survivor around the same, I mean, it's like 67, 68, so a few years after this film takes place, but like, she's a woman who survived the Holocaust and is now just like living her life as a citizen of Paris. And yeah. like, you don't, you don't really get any special privileges. You just, you had, yeah, your, I think it is you even had that maybe experience and even closer to this in time. I think it's like beginning of the sixties and it's, uh, yeah, I think it, it's a crazy, absurd thing. You've seen the the worst of human existence. I think this is something that can yeah. be asked. Again, I'm not trying to like deflect away from the Holocaust, but I know other people who come from either families that abuse them or just truly miserable conditions like, you know, didn't have diapers, were walking around, you know, uh, shitting on the floor as a child, had diluted mm -hmm. formula or something. And at a certain point, you say, what expectations can we have for this person to just start working at the store or something or to like exactly. just be going to the movies and, right. and uh, bridal showers and I mean, whatever I, else. And I had an experience like this. A, a friend of mine was telling me about, because I encountered this person in the context of, this was another UCLA student actually okay. getting a PhD and like he and his husband live in a very lovely apartment in like West LA and mm -hmm. they're cool. They both have jobs and they're, you know, their hair is combed and the, they're happy, you know? Yeah. And he mentioned growing up how sometimes dinner was ketchup packets from McDonald's that his yeah. mom had, had like squirreled away for just such a thing. And at this point I'm, th then I'm thinking like, well, can we, can we still like talk shit about the dining hall food? You know? <laughs> sure. like, yeah. This, yeah. Are we... Uh, and and I don't uh, not to to minimize or suggest that he has he has caused me any no, any problems, no. but also I, like I think so much of so much of the way that we interact with the world is like predicating predicated a little bit on shared common experience, shared yeah. common experience, but also like ignorance of or yeah. or just rejection of of the fact of like horrific suffering. And I also I totally agree. And I also don't want to do what I believe is considered kind of like a re-victimizing thing of making those people feel like they could never integrate in society or never participate in. No, in he's like integrated the very house. well. Yeah. So I absolutely believe people are capable of that, and I hope I hope that for them. I just mean that I don't think anybody should be mad or disappointed or or look down on somebody if that doesn't happen to be the way things like you know turn out in the end. Because I I agree with you. There is kind of a shared illusion or shared delusion about how we talk about the world based on ignorance or or negligence or or some amount of each. And when you encounter somebody who hasn't had that experience, I think it makes you aware of that. I think that can be edifying, mm -hmm. but also I agree with you. It makes you feel a little bit silly for us. To, I mean, we could just pick ourselves to say, oh, what do you do with your time? I spend a lot of time researching for my little podcast that I invented. And sometimes I'll tell myself I have right. to watch three or four movies for the episode. And Sometimes I watch movies that I don't like and then <laughs> yeah. I complain about how yep. uh, I had to watch a movie I didn't like and maybe that's bad for my mental health. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. saying this is disqualifying for us. I just would also not blame them for saying, right. well, that sounds like all that's fake and you didn't really, like it's not a real issue. You know, it's like it. the, the famous old joke of Jewish humor. The food here is terrible. <laughs> And such small portions. Yes, you know. that's right. Um, yeah. The human capacity for complaint mm -hmm. is it's infinite. A, I mean, that is uh, that is one of the more interesting parts of, of yeah. Holocaust fiction where it explores persistent humanity in the worst circumstances, yeah. which, uh, yeah. you know, is also, I think, fascinating to see. But then then speaking of which, I mean, like the, the fellow who wrote um, the book upon which Life is Beautiful is based. Let me pull this fellow's okay. name up. Um, 
guy named uh, Rubino Romeo Salmoni or Salmoni, okay. maybe Ruben Salmon. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> it does. A Russian dressing on that. Yeah. Um, his book, In the End, I Beat Hitler. Uh, when he died in 2011, the mayor of Rome uh, said of him, quote, a great, called him, quote, a great man who with his courage and determination managed to save himself from the hell of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Which really suggests that, like, the rest everybody of the else have, was, a lo- yeah. was a loser. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, that gets at the inherent some of the questions that this film is is looking at, but also like some of the attitudes of the founders of Israel. So let's talk a little bit about let's do the Holocaust and the Nakba. Yep. Um, which, by the way, the uh, famous Hebrew term for the Holocaust, the Shoah, mm-hmm. and the Nakba, the Arabic term, both roughly translate to catastrophe. So they both sort of they're they're similar words. However, yes. it uh, I believe was maybe still is illegal to conflate the two in israel like literally illegal to i am aware of that yeah argue that these things have uh, anything in common yes and a a big question of a big a big sort of justification at the center of a lot of the ethnic cleansing and uh international law defying uh behavior both by israel and the united states it's uh, it's predicated on this idea of the unique suffering, the unique, like unimaginable evil of the Holocaust, and so nothing, nothing can ever be that bad. So anything is justified as long as it's not the Holocaust, which it can't be because it's no longer the forties in German, Germany. Yeah. yeah, I think I want I wanted us to establish a couple of, like agreed upon pillars for our arguments here because tonsilar, ulcer, tonsilar pillar. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's very, those are good starting points because I think. A lot of the objections to all discussions about Palestine rely on assuming that the pro-Palestine person is just not aware of these or refuses to acknowledge these these aspects. One of those is the awful and uh, on a scale unimaginable suffering of the Holocaust. Right. I, I texted you because I was looking for. I'm. I have read many texts about this conflict, this question, the history of it, the modern iterations, the the peace accords, the the seeking for peace. I mean, I don't and even like calling it a conflict because that, that yeah, suggests implies some parody or some yeah. yeah. I mean, wait, yeah, we're we'll get to it. But I just wanted yeah. to say that basically I was trying to find for our discussion today somebody that Israeli historians or uh, you know, like like liberal Israelis trying to find a two state solution type guys are okay with. But part of the problem is almost universally, their first objection is well, either none of this stuff happens, or it happened, but it it doesn't matter that you point out the massacres of the Nakba because you didn't talk about the suffering of uh, the the European Jews, which was behind the thinking of this. And I think that the problem is. What if we just acknowledge that that suffering is like an incalculable amount? How do we move from there in terms of moral thinking? What doesn't that justify? If for you, that is the thing that needs to be taken into account when you're massacring a new village of people, when you're displacing people, when you're uh, coming up with maybe this, uh, I would say, somewhat fantastical vision of your justification for your historical roots for this new state, what, what isn't like on the board uh, as an option? And I think for, for lots of Israeli historians, it strikes me that the answer to that is nothing is, is not on the board. Right. There's nothing that couldn't be considered. I think that's become just overwhelmingly true. And I yeah. think in the face of that, I do relate very much to the institutionalized uh, broken <laughs> minds of true. this film. Where Am I like... the one who's wrong? Is there something wrong with me that I'm not thinking right. this way? Yeah, I wanted to quote really fast Benny Morris, a guy who was like kind of a, he was part of this group of new historians in Israel who were considered maybe questioning some of the founding of Israel or pointing out some of the atrocities that happened in the course of its founding. But then around the time of the Second Intifada, basically flipped the script and became like a one of these guys that I'm discussing. And he was uh, giving an, an interview to Haaretz and he said, I don't think that the expulsions of 1948 were war crimes, talking about the Nakba. There are circumstances in history that justify ethnic cleansing. I know that this term is completely negative in the discourse of the 21st century, but when the choice is between ethnic cleansing and genocide, 
the annihilation of your people. I prefer ethnic cleansing. And then he goes on to say, uh, talking about Ben Gurion, he says, in the end, he faltered. If he had carried out a large expulsion and cleansed the whole country, if he had carried out the full expulsion rather than a partial one, he would have stabilized the state of Israel for generations. Uh, but he says it was impossible to leave a fifth column in the country, meaning the Palestinian people. They had to be done away with. There was no right. other way. And then, then he gets into culture war stuff where he says that uh, revenge pay, plays a central part in the Arab tribal culture. Therefore, the people we are fighting and the society that sends them have no moral inhibitions. So this is the, like the, the degrading process that you see in the right. minds of all these people. Can I can I do a quick plot summary of Zionism? <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. let's right. go back to pre World War II Herschel okay. stuff. Pre World War II. So, um, and a lot of my understanding of this, in particular, comes from Palestine: A Socialist Introduction, which yeah, is a really great, text. extremely yep. uh, accessible and straight to the point text from 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so, pretty upsetting to imagine people writing this. In 2020, Not thinking knowing. it's yeah. about as bad as it could get. Yep. Um, yeah. So they sort of um, they trace the beginnings of Zionism to around the French Revolution and the kind of um, shift in in a mindset uh, that that emerges then of of um, establishing a a state based on principles rather than based on right. Um, uh, like specific geographical heritage or whatever, ethno nationalism. So, yep. uh, which is funny. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea sort of bounces around, percolates for a long time. Um, a man who really kicks it into gear is this guy named Theodore Herzl, or sure Herzl, was. who um, together with a bunch of, and didn't we talk about the British Israelites or whatever at some point? We have, yeah. There's are some there there's there's a a very strange that the, there's a an, an uh, inextricable entanglement between Zionism and the British Empire. Sure was the um, people who had colonized this area and were in charge of what later became the Mandate of Palestine and right. took on like five different forms. But yeah, yes. go on. So, um, and anti-Semitism was a major fact of life for European Jews. For Ooh, yeah. Can I jump in to centuries. say yeah, that's, yeah. I'm going to call that pillar number two. We are not ignoring the global anti-Semitism of places such as the UK, the US, people who were rejecting Jewish yeah. refugees at the time. Uh, and in fact, I think my co-host would join me in arguing that uh, the war crimes uh, committed by the state of Israel are extremely... I was going to say, I don't know if it's good or bad. They are they are intensifying anti-Semitism around the world. They are creating more reasons that people are becoming anti-Semites. They're adding fuel to the fire of anti-Semitism. Yeah, and I don't want to say that there's any justification for anti-Semitism, but there is certainly... No, but I, yeah, yeah, The yeah. Israeli argument is that we should be conflating uh, Judaism -Israel. and Israel yeah. at all times, and I think that is a right. huge mistake. So, uh, there's lots of disagreement among the various... Uh, Zionist uh, uh, sort of uh, what's the, the ideologues about mm. what exactly should be done in order to create basically a Jewish state, a Jewish homeland, a Jewish, a safe place for Jews in the world. This is the thing that they want to make. And there's all kinds of proposed places for it. Uganda comes very close. Um, yep. As this is, uh, uh, you know, just to, to hammer home the, the Britishness of all of this and also the... Uh, Inherent cause of displacement, or the inherent, right. the necessity of of displacement for this this kind of an idea, unless you're going to like Siberia, maybe, and it depends on which part of Siberia. Mm. Um, you're you're gonna have to displace some people if you want a fresh country. Like, Correct at this point in time. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, fast forward to World War One. Um, the Ottoman Empire. Actually, we're not fast forwarding it. Okay. The Ottoman Empire is uh they are they control Palestine which has been sort of settled upon uh in the at this point in the minds of Zionists mm -hmm. uh as the historic homeland of the Jewish people, you know, it's the holy land, it's the it's where uh many of the events of historic Judaism took place. It's where yes. kind of the, yep. the the Talmud is set basically. Mm -hmm. Um 
the Torah, excuse me, the Talmud is the other one. It's where the, it's the discussion it's where the, one, yeah. The Torah is set, basically. Yeah. Um, and so, having settled on Palestine, uh, one of the things Herzl does, for example, uh, was go to the Ottomans and suggest uh, suggest that he could um, sort of rally the Jews to take the the Ottoman side in the Armenian genocide. Yep, and that's correct. Downplay the Armenian genocide in exchange for a settlement in Palestine. So this is from its from its inception. This is a uh, a project that is okay with genocide. That is um, often very deeply anti-Semitic itself. Lots of um, playing into like this is the Jewish character. This is right. the Jewish habit, and literally yeah. using like Nazi words, like calling the Jews of Eastern Europe parasites and things yep. like this. Yeah, and just in case people were lost or had lost track in there, we're talking about like the 1890s here. This yeah, is... yeah, yeah, yeah. 1896. Yeah. He enters into negotiation with the Turkish Sultan. Um, and he, he says, uh, this is from his, uh, historian Lenny Brenner. Hmm. It would have occurred to no one else in the broad Jewish world to have tried to hinder or interfere with the Armenians in their struggle, nor would anyone have thought to support Turkey in any of its wars. And in the end, Zionism gained nothing by its actions. But what was demonstrated early in its history was that there was no criteria. Of, there were no criteria of ordinary humanism that the World Zionist Organization considered itself bound to respect. Yeah. Um, he so he he um, after the after World War One, of course, um, the Ottoman Empire loses, uh, and the British come into control of much of the Middle East and yep. um, sow the seeds of basically every problem facing that region today. Um, began yeah that's yes, right and they yeah. they uh have they they draw up the the mandate of palestine and uh it is under this mandate that yoram kenyuk is born he's born in palestine in 1930 um which is another weird angle on this that he is he found out later that he had like relatives who were killed in the holocaust but this is basically as abstract to him as um like it would be to Jews born in America or something yep. like it's you know exactly. it's not happening yeah. to he was under no threat the British uh, there was apparently maybe a, a Nazi plan to invade Palestine but the British headed it off so like Nazis never they never never got anywhere near there right um, and uh, then there's the Balfour Declaration which was a uh, declaration by the British Empire uh, that the there should be a Jewish state in Palestine mm -hmm. and it's uh, it um, had certain stipulations about how much of Palestine uh, would go to the Jews and how much would go to the Arabs, but um, it was considered sort of a start, a foot in the door by the, right. the Zionists. And yes. then after World War II, um, there were you know uh, plans were were set in motion to not only like fight against the British, literally like sort of overthrow them as a as mm -hmm. their own kind of perverse national independence movement, uh, but also to drive out the uh, extant Arab population. 700,000 people were yes. um, driven from places that they had lived and their families had lived for, you know, hundreds, thousands of years. Um, and a big part of this is like ostensibly to create a home f for and like a you know, I basically like the, I, this is embarrassing, but I was thinking about the fucking elves going into the West. This is like a place where for the Jews to come after this catastrophe has befallen them, like a place for them all, for all Jews to retire or whatever, away from the violence of the world. That is, that's sort of, uh, a, a rhetorical part of, of this project, but like, you know, a hundred thousand, maybe a hundred thousand Jews emigrated to Palestine during World War II. Mm -hmm. And then afterward, the number is, I mean, it's lower than 700,000. It's not like, like Holocaust survivors were by the boatload coming to replace one for each Palestinian who was no, murdered or they were expelled. were massively outnumbered, which I will say is the beginning of, uh, we just don't have the, the airtime to get into it. But yeah. anytime you look up options that were offered as, as like, this was the peaceful solution that the nasty Palestinians rejected. Always consider the amount of people that were being offered to live in each place, the access to resources, the access to the other parts of the same country. Basically, every time it's, we are going to be Israel, 
we're going to have access to most of the geographic, geographically advantageous things. And also we're going to have continuity in our country, like geographic continuity. And these people are going to be in weird atomized versions with way higher population density. And you mentioned it, Jake, but I really want to return to the fact that these people have been living here for conservatively like 1400 years. All right. And right. part of the complexity, if we go to the discussion of like, what is the land of Israel, is that even going back to the Bible or biblical times, basically just the nature of, of like Canaan and, and Babylon and all these, but they were, everybody was constantly being displaced and moving around. And right. it's very yeah. hard to say like, this was their place uh, because the Egyptians come in and kick people out. The Romans come in and kick people out, right? Which is awful as that was bad for them at the time. But it's hard to say like this land was theirs. And then of course, like you said, it almost becomes irrelevant because how many hundreds of years have to pass? I mean, if, if right. like South Americans were frustrated with Spanish colonialism and the real racism that they faced, and they wanted to just go back to Cherokee territory, which like, you know, hundreds or thousands of years earlier. That's where humans descended into South America. Right, right, right. right. Does that make any sense? I don't, I mean, it's, I, I'm not trying to minimize the difficulty of, of protecting yourself from racism, but if you have never been to a place, your family doesn't speak a language from this place. And the people who do live there have photographs and heirlooms and farms that have been running for hundreds of years. You know, at what point does this just not make sense as a, as a, right plan of action. Well, and the only thing, the only way you can sort of sell this to the rest of the world is through a just full court press anti-Semitization. You guys don't want these nasty guys and you don't care about the guys who are there anyway, right? Right. Yes. These are dogs. These are uh, beasts. These are... You Meaning know, the, the Arabic population, but the also Arabic the kind population, of yeah. self-hatred of like, do you want all these Jewish people to come to your country? There's that too. And so much of, of what David Ben-Gurion says, what Theodore Herzl says, what um, all of the founders of Israel say is like pretty similar to Nazi depictions of the Jew, you know? And like, yep. look- my my dad's side of the family is Jewish, is is uh, Ashkenazi Jewish from like Russia and Latvia, Lithuania, right. Poland. And I feel so frightened of Israelis. I feel <laughs> no kinship yeah. with Israelis. Uh, and I don't think that they feel kinship with me. I mean, it's like it's it's its own weird. It's its own very weird, uh, like cultish um, group that that claims s- to have a voice for the entirety of mm-hmm. uh, a very broad diasporic and and like really loosely held together sort of cultural identity. Um, and I mean, I want to read from um, I want to read from from Palestine to social. Actually, this is from the ethnic cleansing of pa- Palestine. But is it Ilan Pepe? Do you know how to say? It? I don't know, but he's one of these guys that uh, Israeli historians hate. I will say he was yes. also in this crew. Yes, yep. but he is, has several texts about this. I think ten so, myths about Israel, things like this. Yes, this is mm. his. Uh, he's his description of Golda Meir's reaction after the Nakba in 1948. She at first found it hard to suppress a feeling of horror when she entered homes where cooked food still stood on the tables, children had left toys and books on the floor. And life appeared to have frozen in an instant. Mayer had come to Palestine from the U.S. where her family had fled in the wake of pogroms in Russia. And the sights she witnessed that day reminded her of the worst stories her family had told her about the Russian brutality against Jews decades earlier. There's also plenty of descriptions of uh, like Holocaust survivors coming to Israel and being offered the home of a Palestinian family and returning to Armenia and stuff. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Rejecting this. I and admire so, this immensely because that I admire is, that them. Is, I, I admire I admire not Golda Meir. <laughs> correct. Uh, yeah. Yes. No, I just mean that the moral clarity of saying, you know what? I'm going to go back to the place where I know there's anti-Semitism because I can see what's wrong with this. That's uh, yes. very and impressive. Look, I mean, that's why I think that the metaphor of the asylum for the whole Israel as cure for Holocaust thing is potent but it's not really it doesn't seem to be of that much interest to to schrader but this whole enterprise thinking about this is completely 
insane. It is like to be it's it's there's there's a uh completely like unfathomable mechanized process of genocide in Europe that kills most of European Jewry and 7 million people of all other types of uh apparently undesirable yes. character, right? Yep. And and uh identities. And then a group of people largely not from Eastern Europe anytime mm -hmm. recently, many of whom are Russian or Russian to the US, like Golda Meir, yep. come in to uh, an unrelated country and they're like, this is ours because yeah. of the thing that happened to people who are like mystically related to us. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then they do things that often look very, very similar to the things that the Nazis did to the point where victims of the Nazis say, you're doing the same thing. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then they say, actually, no, we aren't. Um, and they say, if anybody who's not Jewish says that, you are an awful anti-Semite. If you are Jewish and you say that, you're also an anti-Semite. You you're also hate. an anti-Semite, yes. And then there's, I mean, you, we can drill down into this and find things we don't like anywhere, right? Like Israeli memorials to the Holocaust tend to downplay the the experiences of non-Jewish Holocaust victims, for example. Correct. Which, in fact, they, uh, another thing that they object to in a lot of these texts is anytime one of these historians tries to investigate, like, okay, well, how is this related to general social attitudes about homosexuality, about being a, uh, um, uh, like a Romani person, or I'm not sure what their preferred term is these days, but, uh, uh, or a communist, right? How, like, what was... Right. What was part of the same thinking or was there a shared thinking between like eliminating these subversive elements? And basically the Israeli line is don't you dare compare anything else and and anything that highlights their suffering downplays Jewish suffering, which I would right. just encourage people to say, unfortunately, make room in your head for the suffering of lots of people simultaneously if you want to look at yeah, history. Yeah. It's a good strategy. And so, you know, this is a crazy making enterprise in all sorts of ways what this has to do with acting like a dog <laughs> yeah. a boy who inexplicably also thinks he's a dog a well, boy I have an who turns about out this. not to be the son of or not to be the grandson by the way i had a suspicion that this might be oh, the grandson God, that would have really upset me yeah what's your theory about the dog boy so i think in this film we Ian's have looking in a mirror Ian's looking in a mirror <laughs> yeah uh i think what helps me unlock this is, of course, our old friend, Derek Jacoby. And he is What's in this film. big homie? And he is, of course, in the film of Hereafter. He right? is? And these two films share several pieces of DNA. First of all, I think that they are slightly shot in a similar manner sometimes. <laughs> yeah, they have a uh, similar color grading at points. Yeah. That's right. And also, we have a person who suffered trauma, maybe has supernatural ability now, encounters a boy who's also suffered trauma. And maybe figures out that his gift is not to heal himself, but his to heal this boy and maybe be healed by this boy wow. by their discovery together. And what I think they really share, which I think brings us back to that beautiful discussion of the history of Zionism you just offered, is that they share this sense that the ultimate logic is personal humanistic logic, which I'm a fan of certain types of humanism, but where it falls short is the hyper liberal hyper self focused type of humanism mm -hmm. that says mm -hmm. the ultimate logic is the logic of what feels nice to me and feels good to me and if i feel that i have suffered a lot and maybe i have but then what it basically whatever i want to do is justified because my suffering is the realest suffering that there is and all other types of suffering are hypothetical to me which i i want to be clear I like the film of Hereafter. I think I was surprised by enjoying the, the film of Hereafter to a Same certain here. extent. And I think the reason it's okay there is because it is about a guy with crazy psychic powers and he just wanders right. around and nothing matters. And it's, and it's also about a, a broad sort of uh, individual instances of capital S suffering. Like yes, non-systematic. Exactly. Yes. It's not it's not considering history. It's not considering institutions. It's not considering it's social attitudes. It's just saying, yes, it sometimes sucks to feel bad and worry about death and lose people and feel like you don't know what to do in the world. It doesn't work when you're talking about world historical events and forces that continue to uh, victimize hundreds of thousands or, or two million people in the case of Gazans. Yeah, I mean, 
it's also just reading about the uh, we're not comparing miseries we're not comparing suffering uh-huh. yeah but reading about some of the sort of instances that like galvanized zionism were uh pogroms where like a hundred people were killed and like a thousand people were injured yeah and then looking Which at awful, that of course you personally the worst day of your entire life i'm yeah. sure it would color the way you looked at the world until one your person death. getting murdered or hurt by yep. uh someone because they the uh, out of like ethnic animus yeah that's awful that's yep. unspeakably awful mm-hmm. um but to look at the if you are the kind of person as many in many defenders of israel are who wants to kind of say this is okay because this this amount of suffering is okay because this other amount of suffering was worse yes yep. then if we're playing that numbers game it still right is fucking crazy <laughs> Which, yeah, exactly. They try, their, their like just war approach to it is saying we are preserving the lives of, of our children and the safety of our children and that the cost That's, is just a bit. Could you, could you think you could say that in about 14 words? Yeah, between 13 and 15 words. I could yeah, probably yeah, manage yeah, thank that. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's, yeah I'm I referring, think, of course, to the famous 14 words uh, right. that like Hitler said about preserving the future for Aryan children or whatever that is a sort of Nazi dog whistle uh, phrase. Dog whistle. Um, which reminds me, by the way, of the Palestinian dog whistle uh, that Paul Schrader posted in April uh, of this year. He posted a weird, like, AI photo of a <laughs> whistle that has dog ears that is yeah. the colors of the Palestinian flag. And he says, for, he posted the image without any explanation. And mm-hmm. then in a comment said, that's the Palestinian dog whistle. You may have heard it on your local campus. Yes. Which is... uh. I think a that's about as much nuance and attention given to the question of like Palestinian humanity as the f- the film has. Whereas it's giving a tremendous amount to how complex might the suffering of somebody who was in a concentration camp, and that's a deserved consideration in the sense yeah. that you know it's way beyond just the simplicity of it was awful, right? It was awful, and maybe since then. All sorts of, of interactions and relation, relationships have uh, re-traumatized them. You know, we, uh, I think we've mentioned the film Phoenix on here before, right? Films that explore, like, what is the fallout? How do you continue to live? How do you no, make sense in, of your own? I don't think it could say, it's in, it's in First Class and X2, but I don't think Dark Phoenix has <laughs> oh, any good, Holocaust right. stuff in it. Yeah, it's a good one. I think one. they were over it by that point. Sorry. You know, the, uh, the Christian Petzold film Phoenix. That's right. Is, uh, yes. Yeah. And I mean, I don't... I'm. I'm getting into dicey territory, territory that feels dicey to me <sighs> okay. at this point. But uh, hey, I'll just describe my own reaction to something. Okay. Um, holy shit, did you know that Christian Bale is Gloria Steinem's stepson? Whoa, is that true? Her, she married his father, who died three years later of brain lymphoma. Oh, man. What the fuck? Wow. Anyway, there's a Christian Bale film called... Um, what is that movie called? The Promise, a 2016 yeah. film about the Armenian genocide mm-hmm. that was like pitched as immediately read as like a piece of propaganda is the wrong word, but as like uh, an attempt by by an interest group to dramatize and make known to a wider audience a a specific instance of Mm -hmm. uh, historic suffering right yep and we're so familiar with like the holocaust film um i think in part because like look who is funding holocaust museums and the state of israel rich american jews yeah who, many of whom also work in the entertainment industry as a result of like historical forces that that caused uh, would be on their control, but marginalized them in yeah. certain industries. Yeah, yeah. Are you exactly. going to address the film of a, a the Claude Landsman film? Is this where you're going? I'm not actually. I was not oh. actually going there. But what I was okay. going to say is like, you know, if Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans uh, were had, had a hundred year history as executives of. Uh, yes. movie studios we'd probably yeah. just have a lot of nakba films and that's uh, fair that's fair i, I mean, uh, the reason i mentioned showa is that you know that it was commissioned by like israeli government officials initially uh they asked him to make a i don't film think about i knew that 
I had a Holocaust. dream probably probably in uh you know in the nightmares leading up to this the 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 fact of having to do this episode. I had okay. a weird dream where I was like I think I had to like pick a Claude Landsman film for people to for to to put on like a list. Mm. But in my mind Claude Landsman had also done like I mean not, it wasn't exactly this but basically like the Chipmunks movies. Okay. It was like it was right. a bunch of other like sure. yeah 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 inessential junk and i was like mm. oh right no it should be showa it should definitely be. what are we talking about why didn't i think of that yes. it should definitely be showa yeah 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 smart glad um, dream dream jake got there dream jake got there but like yeah i, I, I mean, don't say that by the way to say like this is like a jewish trap or something i'm saying no, that no, 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 no. it's just to point out that yeah it, when your people have suffered although it, it does feel a little bit mercenary given what we know about how israelis often talk about holocaust survivors as being like weak or not the representations of of judaism well, look, how, much, they want. how much money how much money did the u.s just promise to send to to israel in terms of military aid like 20 billion dollars over 10 years or something yes yep That's... and then there was an article from 2022 about how one third of all holocaust survivors living in israel are below the poverty line right Exactly. That's right. yeah. that, there. You go. All you need to know. Like, yep. there's plenty of money, uh, but Holocaust survivors in Israel are uh, like literally being fed by NGOs because uh-huh. the government won't support like 85 year olds. Uh, That's exactly right. To get enough food, and as my understanding, 85 year olds don't need that much food. <laughs> it's true. It's pretty they easy to feed move them. Move quickly. Uh, they're not hungry. They're just nope. they're they like all a- awake. Pretty early. Yeah, That's they want like three hundred degree yeah. McDonald's coffee. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, half a Danish, and then they say I'm yep. full. I know, and pretty even easy. That, to... Yeah, you've actually. So how allowed... do we? Well, you, I think you've you've set up a beautiful segue for the last topic that I want to address very quickly, which is that if we're using this as a metaphor for Israel or the founding of the Israeli state, uh, I'd like to talk about. You mentioned at the very beginning, like asylum films. Films generally, and, and not the not the no the that's, studio yeah, that was confusing. Not Transmorphers, right? yeah. absolutely right. Yeah, no, uh, I mean like Cuckoo's Nest style traditional stuff about right the very real horrors. If you really, if you want to uh, go a different way and look up some different historical horrors, look up what was happening in the United States mental institutions or global mental mental institutions, specifically yes. to people of color, to women, but really just everybody. Uh, I've heard even, I'm not sure if this is apocryphal, but stories of like walkways that allowed people to pay and visit institutions like freak shows at the circus a little bit. Uh, so this I is mean, a that's level just of care. smart. That's just, that's just paying that's your That's just bills. making it money keeps, two ways. Keeps yeah. the lights on. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. Everybody uh, likes that, you know? Yep. We all like that. And of course, probably most of our listeners know about the 1980s closures of these institutions motivated by a mix of public awareness about suffering, maybe brought about by films like uh, One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest, and also just Reagan era cost cutting, which was the reason that it made it through because they would never have allowed all these crazies to be out unless they felt like it was going to save them a ton of government spending. So (laughs) big government. Yep. Well, this is this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring it all back to your initial bring discussion. It all, bring it all back to the gray ponytail guy that sat next to me at the DMV. That's exactly right. Where it's a this is a difficult question. This is a question that I feel a lot less moral clarity about. But I will say, based on my limited experience and reading and knowledge of the world, it seems like most people who experience mental health crises would be better served it's by like community oriented services, or perhaps better served just by having low cost apartments to them or uh, free apartments available to them or guaranteed food, help getting work placement, right? These things without ever getting into questions of like forced uh, drug application or something just would set people on a good path. And then perhaps we do need some type of institution where people who are really suffering from florid psychosis or uh, could be a harm to themselves or others may need like really active intervention. And I got to say, I've been reading a lot of accounts the last few days of people who have been in these institutions, worked in these institutions, both again, like the patients and the, the nursing and the staffing side. And it seems like the most positive stories are people who just say, hey, you know what? It's really nice when you go into one of these places and maybe you haven't had a lot of chances for people to care about you. The people there don't seem overworked. The food is nice. You get a private room. They ensure that you are active and have contact with the people you can safely have contact with. 
and you are getting lots of one-on-one -on -one therapy. And I got to say, this is a case where bringing it back to our film, the asylum in the film looks pretty nice, uh, even though there's like some discussion of bad. it yeah. as a, as a prison, ultimately there's a sense that like some of these people are maybe uh, will never be able to be reintegrated into society. And maybe it's just nice that they can have a buffet that has wine and foie gras. And I think the part staff of me eats it, eats it tables with them. Yep, exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah, a, I, that's a big thing in a lot of like, um, like mad activism and, and, uh, uh, institution like like psychiatric institution reform is, is right like patients to, uh patient advocates and stuff yeah. patient advocates and and to cut down on the like big burly men in white yeah. um uh the 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 stark distinction between staff and patient which makes right. people feel like they are in the movie shock corridor directed by sam fuller it's exactly right I, I mean honestly some of their claims are so achievable just saying like i would love to have a sense of like what my treatment plan is nobody like i part of the thing i was just scared because nobody told me what i was going to be doing or right. how long i was right, going right. to be there or why i was taking drugs yeah. and stuff if at uh, any point i would like to know what does this medication do how does it work why have you right. wh why did you decide to give this to me instead of a different one i'm allowed to ask and you have to tell me exactly that kind exactly of thing, yeah. which i really dream and i think is truly uh, something that is so attainable for us i do think it speaks to maybe a difficult question, which is sometimes there are social problems that we all acknowledge. Uh, I mean, if you just listen to any San Francisco rhetoric, rhetoric right now, it's so nasty in terms of we got to get these people off the street, right? Like, this is untenable as a, as a situation, right? So whatever we need to do right. to these people has to happen. And right. It's, it's so baffling to me to think of it as like a, a blight on the city with no origin. Like yes, where exactly where yeah. is where do you think these people come from right why is this happening to them have you noticed any characteristics that they all share yep have you noticed like if things you that ask may be them, obstacles to their uh substance abuse recovery or getting yes, back into a, an apartment between perhaps their upbringing and yours yep um and like maybe some of the reasons that they don't know how to code Exactly. When well, you do. I mean, you're, you're exactly right, Jake. Because to me, the, the feeling is actually it's really hard and complex and expensive to address root causes. So let's just go back to mental, mental institutions. And then when these patient advocate type people say, well, can we at least make them really nice and focused on fair treatment and rehabilitation? They say, well, that sounds pretty expensive. So yeah. I think what it comes down to is people are I just... Actually have a, I'm, I'm having a vision of a, a pretty wonderful residential mental health facility mm -hmm. that's got like beanbag chairs and like rooms where you can nap and there's like always cereal available to you <laughs> uh, -huh. uh and you yeah. can you you can use 20 percent of your time for personal use right plenty of exactly uh, unlimited vacation unlimited paternity leave is pretty good for some reason yeah. yeah they pay for they pay for you to take a seminar to learn how to do uh you know some new kind of language that comes out or whatever that's exactly right you, you get like uh a, a bonus to your salary if you do yoga for a special some bus picks you up at your house and takes yep. you straight to work so you don't have to own a car it's talking about places like google.com of google course our com Jake, headquarters very, yes uh yeah so this is Spe speaking of uh speaking of speaking of medical google. staff com. that's right speaking of google.com yeah that she's the answer to all my uh, search Aww, queries. Oh, that's hey, nice. Hey, I certainly feel lucky, like Google. Wow, old school, yep. Yep. Yeah. I asked Jeeves and he sent me an angel. <laughs> of course. She's that mad. Old. She's yep. mad about all that, yeah. Yeah, she should be. Uh, anyway, I only say all this to point out that uh, people are trying to come up with solutions to problems without wanting to commit any resources to them or make their lives even marginally worse, despite how much they imply that these problems are ruining their lives, right? Saying that homeless people are the worst thing that's ever happened to me or people experiencing, people experiencing homelessness are the worst thing that's ever happened to me. So we should send them to, them to, we should send them to a place that's so bad that I basically don't have to pay for it. Nobody has to pay for it. It's just... Right. Uh, they will either rot there forever or die quickly. Right. Yep. Um, to which I have to say... Was Derek Jacobi in Gladiator? Yeah, I think he is uh, 
one of those nets that all some of those guys use. Yeah, actually, oh. you know what? I think he is. He's like one he's of the in, senators, right? He's in half of all. He has like right of first refusal on movies about ancient Rome. Yep. So, no, I think you're absolutely correct. Derek Jacobi on screen and stage, out gay actor, which I learned recently. I yeah, did not know yeah. that about him. Mm-hmm. He is in the film Gladiator as Gracchus. There he is. All right. Uh, he gives a raucous performance <laughs> as Gracchus. Isn't that fun? Yeah. I think uh, that's probably our episode. I think that's probably our episode, Adam too. Resurrected. Um, there's the we whole didn't... Last Temptation of Christ thing. There is. There's a burning bush with Willem Dafoe. I, I think any serious trader heads this is the type of thing that maybe we should be yeah. pointing out but i assume I'm gonna you guys could all i'm gonna read from eric Hines's piece again okay. uh stein's moment of revelation an honest to god water, watershed moment of self-reckoning has an odd ring to it his unreconcilable his irreconcilable life haunted by unspeakable horrors and a totalizing guilt that makes the present untenable is shaped and defined by his being a european jew who survived the holocaust Yet when Stein stumbles into the desert to battle his demons and confronts a burning bush that speaks with the voice of his Nazi tormentor, it's not the Jewish God that we think of, but Martin Scorsese's, with Willem Dafoe transmuted from Jesus to Nazi devil. This strange, almost perverse evocation of the last temptation of Christ veers Adam resurrected into a deep pocket of Schrader-esque Christian symbolism. I can't say if Yoram Kaniuk had this in mind when he wrote Adam Resurrected, but it's the one moment when this film about a madman is truly tremendously insane. So... Yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, we didn't mention this. This is the type of boring stuff. I think his madness sequences are pretty boring. The dream sequence stuff is pretty boring. This I mean, scene, I, I didn't yeah. find a lot in. I really don't like movies about mental illness that uh, fit the mental illness neatly into the needs of, of a narrative. I find yep. that boring and um, in poor taste. I. It should be, if you're going to try to represent artistically, it should probably be as frustrating as it is to deal with and be around exactly in real life not not as uh like you're saying straight edged right in the the narrative Mm -hmm. hole yeah it was kind of cool when the fuck what's a straight edge band brand new played (laughs) over the end credits yeah yeah a a straight edge band i don't know um now i can't remember what's the name of the band who plays straight edge like fugazi and minor threat yeah Yeah, there you go minor threat yeah yeah i don't know would have been cool to see orson welles in the clown makeup that's for damn sure. Sure would have, yeah. Would have maybe needed more than Goldblum. That's, yeah, just volume-wise. I'm going to assume that. We mm-hmm. also got old Moritz Bleibtro in here. And, uh, uh, yeah, old Moritz from The Walker, our friend mm-hmm. from The Walker. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I mean, fucking um, Vincent D'Onofrio Kingpin's girlfriend from Correct. the Netflix Daredevil show, Ayelet yes. Zurer, mm-hmm. who is... Again, it's kind uh, of a like a narrative at, or thematic dead end yeah. for me. Not her fault right, at right, all. Right. But she does have to do a lot of barking like a dog for she like does. sexual reasons, which I suppose is brave. Yeah. I guess. Um the kind of woman born to be in a Zack Snyder film. There's just <laughs> something about this particular You're look right. of yeah. woman who is in so many Zack Snyder films, including her. She's in yep. Man of Steel or something. Exactly she plays Superman's mom. Mm-hmm. A little weird. A little weird. To have an Israeli woman play the mother of the Ubermensch. I don't know. Hmm. Is it? I mean, wasn't it written by two Jewish guys to, for that exact purpose? You have to ask Michael Chabon? Chabon? Another historical figure. Yes. That's right. Um, that's going to probably cool. do it for us. Oh, wait. Nope. We got one Uh-oh. more thing we got to do. It's the sexual I'm, obsession check. I already know my answer. I thought about this one during the film for maybe the first time. Okay. Uh, that's... Interesting. I've been thinking about it during all of them because I'm trying to do my job. But uh, <laughs> oh wait, I didn't explain anything about this. No. This is where uh, Paul. So Paul Schrader said this uh, to an interviewer in a Q and A a few months ago. I've never written a script about sexual obsession, and uh, so that's the one I'm doing now. And we here on the show are doing our best to determine which films he has written that are not about sexual obsession, and. Uh, Ian, what did you decide on during your doing for the film? I'm going to put this one, we've done this before, so I don't feel like it's cheating. This one's a kind of for me. Mm-hmm. There's a distinctly mm-hmm. sexual mm-hmm. obsessive aspect to this about being a dog, about turning the objects of your attraction or degradation into dogs. Uh, sex comes up a couple different ways in here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say he's it's... A, yeah, he's a horn dog. He is a horn dog. That's, I thought you were going to bring that when we talked about Goldblum. It's, like, it's also playing into the 
attractive but maybe so sexually aggressive that is this a bad thing yeah he's Question he's got him. a he's got a tinge of the creep to him but he is so charming but right. also kind of skeezy yep um so yeah i think a kind of their sexual obsession is a is a big part of this and i think lots of films depicting nazi sadism yeah it's i was hard. gonna say because yeah. Yeah, the, the sadistic instincts, the degradation instincts. The... You know where I, I noticed it a lot, actually, was in Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. <laughs> yeah, I wow. A lot of... You're pretty keen-eyed. I don't remember that. Yeah. yeah. Pretty pretty smart guy. I've seen a lot of movies. You sure um, are. Yeah. Played a lot of... Uh, the fuck is this game called? Musashi? Brave Fencer <laughs> Brave Musashi? Fencer? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Guy looks just like me. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, that's, I think, a, you know, that's an episode of the show. It's an episode of the show. I would say, you know what? I found myself in the surprising position of saying, if you have some extra time, maybe worth checking out. If you don't, I would watch something else, which yeah, is I mean, I would, maybe the most boring response possible to this I film, would put but. this in the pre, pre-viewing category or the pre, the, the, this is a, of the type of direct, of, of auteur uh, wilderness picture where I would have put hereafter before I saw it. Okay, yeah. But I think the hereafter actually has a lot more Essential going on insights. with it. Mm. And I think I think the the kind of you might call it liberal like uh uh individual level humanism is is what we found so charming about many of Clint's films. And I, I think, think so too. Cuz it's explored is, in opposition to some of his his right. uh, inferior instincts and then here yeah Schrader seems aware of more specific political thought so this falls flat for me a little bit. Yeah. Weird stuff, weird wild stuff. Weird wild uh, stuff. Speaking of weird wild stuff, next week is The Canyons. Mm. So that'll be, be yep. pretty strange. Um I already have my two question picked out. Wow. Let's just say it's locked and loaded. Okay. Uh, with that, remember to subscribe, rate us, write a review. It helps us on the algorithm. If you like the show, tell a friend, tell your dad, uh, write a novel. I don't know. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Podcast Deform. If you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you're interested in co-hosting a two-person Paul Schrader podcast, you can email us at podcastdeformity.com. That's not right. You can email us at podcastdeformity at gmail.com. Mm. Thank you to Jeremy Allison for our artwork. Canyons next week. Get your freaking um, hiking boots on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's kind of like it, it, the film's like Jerry. It's a lot like Jerry. It's a lot like Us Fans Dance Jerry. We will actually yeah. be doing sort of a two, like a compare and contrast. Mm-hmm. So. See you there. Bye.